Good afternoon and good morning to you wherever you are in the world and welcome to the show must go online. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director and creator of the Shakespeare Deck. Every week a global cast and crew of all levels of experience donate their time and talent freely as part of an ongoing mission to create Shakespeare for everyone for free forever. Tonight's production of William Shakespeare's Coriolanus will commence in approximately 15 minutes time. Content warnings for this show include violence, blood, gore and state oppression. But first, I'd like to welcome our cast member for this evening, Chi Chi Onua, to speak about the ongoing state violence happening right now in Nigeria. Chi Chi, are you there? Hello, Rob, thank you. Lovely to see you, the floor is thank yours. You. Thank you. Um, yes, so as you may have already seen online, there are human rights being violated in Nigeria, which is also my family's home country. Uh, people are being brutalized over the peaceful protesting of the dissolution of the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, uh, otherwise known as SARS. So um, if you're looking for ways to help out, there are a few ways. Um, first of all, stay informed, you know, look up sources. Um, second of all, lend your voice online, um, especially with social media right now. Use the hashtag uh, NSARS. And uh, finally, donate funds if you are able to. Uh, I recommend donating to the Feminist Coalition. It's an organization run by the young Nigerian feminists who are dispersing the funds to help those who are being, um, who are in need right now. So uh, please stay informed and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Chi Chi, for that. There is a link in the video description where you can find out how to donate uh, to organizations on the ground and also find some useful articles to help yourself get informed in the situation out there right now. And now to introduce tonight's play, brought to us as always by the resplendent Ben Crystal, it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Elizabeth E. Tavares and Matthew Minicucci. Elizabeth E. Tavares, PhD, is Assistant Professor in the Hudson Strode Program in Renaissance Studies at the University of Alabama. She specializes in playing companies, English theater history, and dramaturgy. Her current book project is tentatively entitled Play in the Stock Market, the Repertory System Before Shakespeare. Matthew Minicucci is Senior Fellow with the Blunt Scholars Program at the University of Alabama. His most recent collection of poetry, Small Gods, won the 2019 Oregon Book Award. Elizabeth and Matthew, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the show this evening. The show tonight, of course, is Coriolanus, and the floor is yours. In the early days of the Roman Republic, grain is being withheld to feed soldiers rather than her people. Riot ensues. Attempting to console the people, Senator Menenius allays them with reason while General Caius Martius hurls insults. This conflict between the people and the state goes unresolved, however, as Caius Martius is called away to defend Rome from a Volscian advance. Thus, the opening salvo of the play pits need abroad against need at home. So to whom does Rome belong? In his attempt to take the city of Coriolis, General Caius Martius meets his Volscian equal, General Tullus Alphidius, in the field. If Caius Martius loses, Rome physically belongs to the Volscians, mirroring the struggle at home. But it's a draw, and the question goes unanswered. Alphidius is pulled away by his soldiers at the last moment, and Coriolanus is left to bring this triumph home to Rome. Interpreted as a glorious success, the patricians, the blue blood land owning ruling class of Rome, attempt to leverage this victory to convert General Caius Martius into consul Coriolanus. The tension from the grain conflict remains unresolved and is in fact exacerbated by Coriolanus's unwillingness to humble himself to the people in order to gain the position. Tribunes take advantage of this moment by stoking the anger of the public to the point that they call for his death. In response, Coriolanus exiles himself. With Alphidius, he leads the Volscian armies to the gates of Rome, only stopped by the pleading of his mother. There was a price to be paid in striking a truce. Elizabeth and I want to talk on and think on both sides of some of the questions this play summons. I from the vantage of Republican Rome and she from Jacobean London. So it's a duel. In fact, we could say it's a duel, D-U-A-L, as in the grammatical number of not singular and not plural in language with inflected morphology like ancient Greek with hints of it in Latin. 
like eyes and arms, Hamlet to his foil, Laertes, two distinct real world entities that function as pairs and require one another. We see a lingering ghost of it in our own English plurals, both versus all, either versus any, neither versus none, London versus Rome, patrician versus pleb, Coriolanus versus Aufidius, people versus city. So the first duel is a political one, belly versus head. What should drive decisions in representative government? As contemporaries, we are taken with the notion of reason as deriving from the mind, from the head, from logic. King James VI and I, newly brought down from Scotland to govern England that didn't know him, styled himself head of the nation, head of the church, head of the newly named Britain. Framing the Commonwealth's head as monarch was a rhetorical departure for English government, wherein his predecessor, Queen Elizabeth I, claimed the, quote, heart and stomach of a king and a king of England, too, end quote. This focus on the stomach would have made perfect sense to the Romans. The belly was the center of all decision making. Where we reference our head and our heart, they would have appealed to their entrails, viscera. Reasonable decisions derived from spilling open the bellies of little birds and reading prophecies of their arranged innards, an act called augury from Avis or bird. In fact, when his mythical founders, Romulus and Remus, disagree on the number of birds they see in the sky, one kills the other. It's called Rome for a reason. In his attempt to soothe the hungry people in need of grain, Senator Menenius counsels with the parable of the belly. Once upon a time, the body revolted against the belly for being lazy, the only part that did not contribute actively to its survival, and hoarded all the food. The belly replied, it is the storehouse and workshop of the body, necessary to equally distribute resources, quote, through the rivers of your blood to all its parts whereby they live, end quote. If the senators of Rome are the belly and the people its, quote, mutinous members, end quote, then to resist one's leaders is to harm oneself. Such a moral is an argument in favor of oligarchy and against democracy. But Rome isn't a monarchy or a democracy. It's a republic, res publico, literally meaning the stuff of the people. The play is set just after the expulsion of the last kings in Rome, thus establishing the Roman Republic. Comprising that republic are senators who are always from patrician families. In addition, there are two consuls, also always from patrician families, who act as sort of magistrates of Rome and are designed to check power of any single individual. Finally, there are the crucial tribunes, a position invented after the first insurrection of the plebeians with the power to gather the people together in assembly and propose legislation. Most importantly, tribunes held the power of intercessio, which allowed them to speak on behalf of any citizen and resist any action. But who intercedes on behalf of the English to a Scottish king? Who watches the watchers? Which I think gets at another useful duel, pride and shame. Coriolanus is routinely accused of being prideful, most importantly when he refuses to show his wounds in the marketplace to the people as proof of his sacrifice in their service. His mother and his friends advise him to suck it up and fake it. If only he were a better actor, he would have been consul. He was proud actors. It is this problem of equivocation to believe one thing in your heart or stomach, but swear to its opposite that occupies James's government with laws on the books against it, activates witch trials that travel across the Atlantic to Salem by the end of the century, and motivate critique of the playing profession. It was an actor's job to pretend and convince others of something they were not. More problematic than Macbeth in this regard, Coriolanus seems to register neither pride nor shame. In De Republica, Cicero, the chickpea himself, describes Rome as a place where its citizens seek approbation and avoid opprobrium. Their sense of shame with which nature has endowed men is a certain dread of just censors. Shame, no less effectively than fear, restrains the citizens. The same applies indeed to the love of praise. The blush was in and of itself penalty enough. The play is obsessed with pride, with shame, and the blush telling the difference, the body will out. You might keep track of when pride is expected and when shame. Does it effectively restrain the right characters at the right time? But for Jacobean players, blushing on cue was a part of the gig. For Romans, blushing on cue was the surest sign of untrustworthiness. But in early modern England, the blush signified differently and activated forensic desires for what was happening inside other people. For Roman slaves, who by the way did all the acting, as much as Shakespearean players, the blush is where the actor maintains control over the body, precisely the point where the character claims no such control is possible. 
And maybe that's one reason why we don't like Coriolanus or really find any other character relatable for that matter. He won't blush on cue or otherwise. He's motivated neither by shame nor pride. He is a hero in the most traditional sense in that he offers an untenable moral compass or worldview. And ultimately, he dies for it, despite the usefulness that he provides. As a final duel, what is the people without us? As playgoers, we are put in the position of the plebeians to whom Coriolanus flings vitriolic epithets, curs whose favor is, a value, is as valuable as a dead man's and whose opinion is easily influenced by, quote, every feeble rumor, end quote. We are by default complicit as passive witnesses to the action, just as we are made the jury to Portia's sentence of Shylock in The Merchant of Venice or Hal's army in Henry V. In fact, some argue that in collaborative projects, Shakespeare was brought in as a protest specialist able to create scenes of public resistance, such as that led by Jack Cade in Henry VI, or the street scenes in Julius Caesar. Here, it is helpful to know that classical play is part of the public curriculum in early modern England, an essential pedagogical tool in which everyone memorized parts in order to practice by rote how to mount a rhetorical defense to play devil's advocate. Rather than mounting arguments, Shakespeare's Coriolanus asks us to think on both sides of the duel, both sides of the question. And there are a number of questions this play can summon that we invite you and your bellies. to consider. Being in the midst of a global pandemic will no doubt activate concerns around food insecurity and the stratification of wealth. While we are all sailing through this crisis together, the comfort of our individual boats differ. What is the role of advice giving and advice taking? Consider to what extent, for example, Coriolanus solicits and takes advice as compared to Alphidius. While the relationship between Coriolanus and his mother Volumina is complex, it can have new meaning if you consider her as not literally his mother, but rather as an allegorical figure of Rome herself. If his mother is Rome, then who is the father figure in this metaphor? By extension, who gets to have influence over whom? And whom do we, should we, and why do we give over our power, our sovereignty? No doubt that will resonate for US attendees in the midst of conflict over Supreme Court nominees, as well as a national election where an allowed minority is manipulating a range of social ills to incite a majority. Do we need to see the needs at home as necessarily in opposition to the needs abroad, or rather as part of the same body? Quite possibly, Coriolanus might suggest that the stuff of the people, like this broadcast, is not constrained by national borders. Thinking beyond those duels by which, as Volumina reminds us, quote, we are bound together, unquote, in this body natural and body politic. Thanks so much for having us. We hope you enjoy the show. Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction, Matthew and Elizabeth. Really appreciate you coming out here, setting the scene so wonderfully for our audience. If I can ask you now to retire to our, our backstage area, thank you so much, as the show is about to begin. Uh, Grandlings, please take your seats, get ready to enjoy the show. Why, don't, why not like this video if you thought that introduction was cracking as I did? Subscribe to the channel while you're there, remembering, of course, to hit the bell to receive all notifications about our final four shows after tonight. Night. Follow us at TSNG Online Live on Twitter or at The Show Must Go Online on Insta and Facebook. And please enjoy William Shakespeare's Coriolanus. to famish? First, you know Caius Martius is chief enemy to the people. We know it. We know it. We know it. We know it. Let us kill him and we'll have corn at our own price. Is it a verdict? No, 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 Boo! Party surfeits on would relieve us if they would yield us, but the superfluity while it oh, yeah. we might guess they relieved us humanely. 
but they think we are too dear. The uh. link that afflicts us, the object of our misery, is an misery. inventory to particularize their abundance. Sufferance is a gain to them. Let us revenge this with our pikes, ere we become rakes. For the gods know I speak this in hunger for bread, not Whoa. in thirst for revenge. Yes. Yes. Would you proceed especially against Caius Martius? Against him first. He's a very dog to the commonality. Hey! Ditto, hey! oh. you what services he's done for his country. Those soft conscious men can be content to say it was for his country. He did it to please his mother. Oh. <laughs> and to be partly proud, which he is, even to the altitude of his virtue. What shouts are these? The other side of the city is risen. Why stay we prating here to the capital? Soft, who comes here? Worthy Menonus Agrippa, one that hath always loved the people. He's one honest enough, but all the rest were so. <laughs> <laughs> What works, my countrymen, in hand? Where go you with bats and clubs? The matter, speak, I pray you. Our business is not unknown to the Senate. Yeah. Had in wait, wait, wait. Fortnight that we intend to do, which now we'll show them in deeds. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Why, masters, my good friends, mine honest neighbours, will you undo yourselves? We cannot, sir. We are undone already. Yes. Well, yes. I tell you, friends, most charitable care have the patricians of you. For the dearth, the gods, not the patricians make it. And your knees to them, not arms, must help. Oh. True indeed. They ne'er cared for us yet. Yeah. Suffer us famish and their storehouses crammed with mm. grain. Yeah. Make edicts mm. of usury to support usurers. Repeal daily any wholesome act established against the rich and provide more piercing oh. statues daily to chain up and restrain yeah. the yeah. poor. Yes! yes. If the wars eat us not up, they will. And there's all the love they bear us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Either you must confess yourselves wondrous malicious, or be accused of it. Maybe you have heard it, but since it serves my purpose, I will venture to stale it a little more. Well, I'll hear it, sir. Yet you must not think to fob off our disgrace with a tale. There was a time when all the body's members rebelled against the belly, thus accused it, that only like a gulf it did remain in the midst of the body, idle, never bearing like labor with the rest, whereas other instruments did see and hear, devise, instruct, walk, feel, and mutually participate, did minister unto the appetite and affection common of the whole body. The belly answered. Well, sir, what answer made the belly? Uh, sir, I shall tell you, with a kind of smile, but even thus, it tauntingly replied to the discontented members, the mutinous parts that envied this receipt, even so most fitly as you malign our senators for that they are not such hmm. as you. Your bellies answer what? The kingly crowned head, the vigilant <laughs> eye, the counselor heart, mm -hmm. the arm, our soldier, our skin, mm. the yep. leg. Hey, hey. <laughs> with other muniments and petty helps in this our fabric is that they what then the former agents if that they did complain what could the belly answer i will tell you 
if you'll bestow a small of what you have little patience a while, you just hear mm -hmm. the belly's answer. You're long about it. Note <sighs> me this, good friend. Your most grave belly thus answered. True is it, my incorporate friends, quoth he, that I receive the general food at first which you do live upon, and fit it is, because I am the storehouse and the shop of the whole body. But if you do remember, I send it through the rivers of your blood, even to the court, the heart, to the seat of the brain, and through the cranks and offices of man, the strongest nerves and small inferior veins from me receive that natural competency whereby they live. Mm -hmm. Though all at once cannot see what I do deliver out to each, yet I can make my audit up that all from me do back receive the flower of all, and leave me but the bran. What say you to it? It was an answer. <laughs> <laughs> the senators of Rome are this good belly, and you the mutinous members. What members. do you think? Wow. You the great toe of this assembly? Oh. I, the great toe. Mm. Why the great toe? For that being one of the lowest, basest, poorest of this oh, most poorest. wise rebellion, thou goest foremost. Thou rascal, but our worst in blood to run, leads first to win some vantage. But make you ready your stiff bats and clubs, Rome and her rats are at the point of rats. battle. The one side must have bail. Hail, noble Martius! Thanks. What's the matter, you licentious rogues, <laughs> that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs? We have ever your good word. What would you have, you curs, that like not peace nor war, the one affrights you, the other makes you proud. He that trusts to you, where he should find you lions, finds you hares. Where foxes, geese, you are no surer, no, than is the coal of fire upon the ice, or hailstone in the sun. Your virtue is to make him worthy whose offence subdues him, and curse that justice did it. Justice! justice deserves greatness, deserves your hate. And your affections are a sick man's appetite, who desires most that which would increase his evil. What's the matter? That in these several places of the city, you cry against the noble senate, who, noble? under the gods, keep you in awe, which else would feed on one another. Feed? What's their seeking? for corn at their own rates, whereof yes, they say yes, yes. Yeah. He is well stored. Hang them, they say. They'll sit by the fire and presume to know what's done in the capital. They say there's grain enough. Would the nobility lay aside their roof and let me use my sword? I'd make a quarry with thousands of these quartered slaves oh, as I, I, as I could pick my lance. Nay, these are almost thoroughly persuaded, for though abundantly they lack discretion, yet are they passing cowardly. But I like, what says the other troop? They are dissolved, Hangham. They vented their complainings, which being answered, and a petition granted them. A stranger to break the heart of generosity and make bold power look pale. They threw their caps as they would hang them on the horns of the moon, shouting their emulation. <laughs> what is granted them? Five tribunes. <laughs> and oh, yes. their vulgar yes. wisdoms. <laughs> Of their own choice. At once, uh, Junius Brutus, Tinius yes. Volutus, and, uh, I know not, Death 
Hey. Rabble should have first unroofed the city ere so prevailed with me. This is straight. Go get you home, you fragments. Where's Caius Marshes? Here? What's the matter? The news is, sir, the Vorskis are in arms. I am glad, aunt. Then we shall have a means to vent our musty superfluity. <laughs> See, our best elders. Marcius, it is true that you have lately told us the Volskis are in arms. They have a leader, Tullus Ophidius, that will put you to it. I sin in envying his nobility, and were I anything but what I am, I would wish me only he. You have fought together. We're half to half the world by the ears, and he upon my party, I'd revolt to make only my wars with him. He is a lion that I am proud to hunt. Then, worthy Martius, attend upon Cominius to these walls. It is your former promise. Yeah, it is, and I am constant. Titus Lartius, thou shalt see me once more strike at Tullus' face. What, art thou stiff? Stand'st out? No, Caius Martius, I'll lean upon one crutch and fight with t'other ere stay behind this business. Oh, true bread. Your company to the capital, where I know our greatest friends attend us. Lead you on. Follow Cominius. We must follow you. Right worthy you priority. Noble Martius. Hence, to your homes. Be gone. Nay, let them follow. The Volskis have much corn. Take these rats thither to gnaw their garners. Worshipful mutineers, your valour puts well forth. A prey, follow. Was ever man so proud as is this Martius? Being moved, he will not spare to gird the gods. Be mock the modest moon. The present wars devour him. He has grown too proud to be so valiant. But I do wonder his insolence can brook to be commanded under Cominius. Fame at which he aims, in whom already he's well graced cannot better be held nor more attained than by a place below the first. For what miscarries shall be the general's fault? Besides, if things go well, opinion that so sticks on Marcia shall, of his demerits, rob Cominius. Let's hence, and hear how the dispatch is made, and in what fashion, more than his singularity, he goes upon this present action. That's a long. One, two. Coriolis, the Senate House. So, in your opinion, Aphidius, that they of Rome are interred in our consuls, and now and now know how we proceed. Is it not yours? It is not four days gone since I heard thence. These are the words. I think I have the letter here. Yes, here it is. They have pressed a power, but it is not known whether for east or west. The dearth is great, the people mutinous. And it is rumoured, Cominius, Martius, your old enemy, who is of Rome worse hated than you, and Titus Lartius, a most valiant Roman, these three lead on this preparation with it is bent. Most likely, tis for you. Consider of it. By the discovery, we shall be shortened in our aim which was to take in many towns ere almost Rome should know we were afoot. Noble Aphidius, take your commission, hie you to your bands, let us alone to guard Coriolis. I think you'll find they've not prepared for us. <laughs> Doubt not that. If we and Caius Martius chance to meet, tis sworn between us we shall ever strike till one can do no more. Farewell. Farewell. daughter sing or express yourself in a more comfortable sort if my son were my husband i should freely rejoice in that absence wherein he won honor than in the embracements of his bed where he would show most love 
When yet he was but tender-bodied and the only son of my womb, I was pleased to let him seek danger where he was like to find fame. To a cruel war I sent him, from whence he returned, his brows bound with oak. I tell thee, daughter, I sprang not more in joy at first hearing he was a man-child than now in first seeing he hath proved himself a man. But if he had died in the business, madam, how then? Then his good report should have been my son. Hear me profess sincerely, had I a dozen sons, each in my love alike, and none less dear than thine and mine good Martius, I had rather had eleven die nobly for their country than one die live voluptuously surfeiting out of action. Madam, the Lady Valeria is come to visit you. I beseech you, give me leave to retire myself. Indeed you shall not. Methinks I hear hither your husband's drum. See him pluck Orphidius down by the hair, as children from a bear, the Volskis shunning him. Methinks I see him stamp thus, his bloody brow with his mailed hand, then wiping forth he goes. What a under the Oh, Jupiter, no blood. Away, you fool. It is more becomes a man than guilt his trophy. Tell Valeria we are fit to bid her welcome. Heavens, bless my lord from fell Ophidius. He'll beat Ophidius' head below his knee and tread upon his neck. Hmm. My ladies both good day to you. Sweet madam. I am glad to see your ladyship. How do you both? How does your little son? I thank your ladyship. Well, good madam. He had rather see the swords and hear the drum than look upon his schoolmaster. Ah, <laughs> oh, my word, the father's son. I'll swear, tis a very pretty boy. Ah, oh, my trust, I looked upon him on Wednesday half an hour together. Has such a confirmed countenance. I saw him run after a gilded butterfly, and when he caught it, he let it go again, and after it again, and over and over he comes, and up again, catch it again. Whether his fall enraged him, or how it was, he did so set his teeth and tear it. Oh, I were not tarry mannequin. One of his father's moods. <laughs> Indeed, lad, he's a noble child. A crack, madam. Come, lay aside your stittery. I must have you play the idle housewife with me this afternoon. No, good madam, I will not out of doors. Not out of doors? She shall, she shall. Indeed, no, by your patience. I'll not over the threshold till my lord returns. Fie, you confine yourself most unreasonably. Come, you must go visit the good lady that lies in. I wish her speedy strength and visit her with my prayers, but I cannot go thither. Why, I pray you? It is not to save labour, nor that I want love. In truth, la, go with me, and I'll tell you excellent news of your husband. Oh, good, madam, there cannot be none yet. In earnest, it's true. I heard a senator speak it. Thus it is. The Norskis have an army forth, against whom Cominius, the general, is gone, with one part of our Roman power. Your lords and Titus Lartius are set down before their city, Carillas. They nothing doubt prevailing, and to make it brief wars. This is true. Oh, my honour, answer my brain. Go with us! Give me excuse, good madam. I will obey you in everything hereafter. Let her alone, lady. She is, as she is now, she will but disease our better mirth. Well then, farewell. Yonder comes news. A wager they have met. My horse to yours, no. Done. Agreed. Say, has our general met the enemy? Uh, they lie in view, but have not spoke as yet. So the good horse is mine. <laughs> I'll buy him of you. No, I'll nor sell nor give him. Lend you here my will for half a hundred years. Summon the town. How far off lie these armies? Within this mile and half. 
and we shall hear their larum and they ours. Now, Mars, I prithee, make us quick in work, that we with smoking swords may march from hence to help our fielded friends. Come, blow thy blast. Tullus or Phidias, is he within your walls? No, nor a man that fears you less than he. That's lesser than a little. Hark you, far off. There is a Phidias. List what work he makes amongst your cloven army. Oh, they are at it. Their noise be our instruction. Ladders, ho! They fear us not, but issue forth their city. Now put your shields before your hearts and fight with hearts more proof than shields. Come on, my fellows! He that retires, I'll take him for a Volsky, and he shall feel mine edge. of the South light on you, you shames of Rome. You heard of files and plagues, plaster you war, that you may be abhorred farther than seen, and one infect another against the wind a mile. Mend and charge home. Oh, by the fires of heaven, I'll leave the foe and make my wars on you. Look to it. Come on! <laughs> 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 Oh, now the gates are ope. Now prove good seconds. Tis for the followers fortune widens them, not for the flyers. Mark me and do the like. Ah! <laughs> oh, fool hardiness, not I. Nor I. They have shut him in. To the pot, I warned him. What has become of Martius? Slain, no doubt. Following the flyers, he is himself alone to answer to all the city. Oh, noble fellow! Who sensibly outdares his senseless sword? Thou wast a soldier. Not fierce and terrible, only in strokes, but with thy grim looks and the thunder like percussions of thy sounds, thou madst thine enemies shake. As if the world were feverous and did tremble. What's that? Oh, tis Martius. Let's fetch him off or make remain alike. <laughs> One five, Coriolis, a street. There is the man of my soul's hate, Ophidius, piercing our Romans. Then, valiant Titus, take convenient numbers to make good the city, whilst I, with those that have the spirit, will haste to help Cominius. Worthy sir, thou bleedst. Thy exercise hath been too violent for a second cause of fight. Ah, uh, praise me not. <sighs> My work hath not yet warmed me. Fare you well. The blood I drop is rather physical than dangerous to me. To Orphidius, thus I will appear and fight. Now the fair goddess Fortune, full deep in love with thee, and her great charms misguide thy opposer's swords. Thy friend no less than those she placeth highest. So, farewell. <sighs> Six, Coriolis, Cominius Camp. Breathe you, my friends. Well fought. We are come off like Romans, neither foolish in our stance nor cowardly in retire. By news? 
the citizens of Corrales have issued and given to Lashes and to Marsh's battle. I saw our party driven to the trenches and then I came away. Who's yonder that does appear like he were flayed? Oh God, he has the stamp of Marcius, and I have before time seen him thus. Am I too late? I, if you come not in the blood of others, but mantled in your own. Oh, in arms as sound as when I wooed, in heart as merry as when our nuptial day was done, and tapers burnt to bedward. Ah. Uh. Oh, flower of warriors. Where is that slave which told me they had beat you to your trenches? Where is he? Call him hither. Let him alone. He did inform the truth. But for our gentlemen, the common file, plague, tribunes for them, the mouse ne'er shunned the cat as they did budge from rascals worse than they. Well, how prevailed you? Will the time serve to tell? I do not think. Where is the enemy? Are you lords of the field? If not, why cease you till you are so? As I guess, Martius, their bands in the vanguard are the Antiates of their best trust. O'er them, Ophidius, their very heart of hope. I do beseech you, by all the battles wherein we have fought, by the blood we have shed together, by the vows we have made to endure friends that you directly set me against, Orphidius and his antiates, and that you not delay the present, but filling the air with swords advanced and darts, we prove this very hour! Oh, I <laughs> conducted to a gentle bath and bombs apply to you, yet there I never deny your asking. Take your choice of these best, that best can aid your action. Those are they, that most are willing. If any such be here, as it was sin to doubt, that love this painting wherein thou see me smeared, if any fear lesser his person than an ill report, if any think brave death outweighs <sighs> life, yeah, <laughs> he's dearer than himself. <laughs> him alone. Or so many, so minded, wave thus his sword to express <sighs> his position and follow Martian! <laughs> <laughs> Shows be not outward, which of you but is for Volsky's <laughs> and is able to bear against the great Orphidius a oh. shield as hard as his. Oh. Watch on, uh, my fellows. Make good this ostentation, and you shall divide in all with us. <laughs> <laughs> Seven Coriolis, the gates. So let the ports be guarded. Keep your duties as I have set them down. If I do send, dispatch those centuries to our aid. The rest will serve for a short holding. If we lose the field, we cannot keep the town. You're not for our care, sir. Hence, and shut your gates upon our guider. Come to the Roman camp, conduct us. One eight, Coriolis, the field of battle. I'll fight with none but thee, for I do hate thee, worse we than a promise breaker. We hate alike. Not Afric owns a serpent I abhor more than thy fame and fortune. Fix thy foot. Let the first budger die the other slave, and the gods doom him after. If I fly, Martius, hollow me like a hare. Within these three hours, Tullus, alone I fought in your Coriolis walls and made what work I pleased. Tis not my blood wherein thou seest me masked, for thy revenge wrench up thy power to the highest. Wert thou the heck? that was the whip of your bragged progeny, thou shouldst not scape me here! Ah! 
I should tell thee or this thy day's work, thou'lt not believe thy deeds. But I'll report it where senators shall mingle tears with smiles in the end admire, where ladies shall be frighted and gladly quaked hear more, where the dull tribunes that with the fusty plebeians hates thine honors shall say against their hearts, we thank the gods our Rome has such a soldier. Yet camest thou to our morsel of this feast, having fully dined before. <laughs> oh, general, here is the steed. We, the comparison, hadst thou beheld it. Only now, no more. My mother, who has a charter to extol her blood, when she does praise me, grieves me. I have done as you have done. That's what I can. Induced as you have been. That's for my country. He that has but effected his good will hath thou attained mine act. You shall not be the grave of your deserving. Rome must know the value of her own. T'were a concealment, worse than a theft, no less than a traducement to hide your doings, not to reward what you have done before our army hear me. I, I have some wounds upon thee, and they smart to hear themselves remembered. Should they not, well might they fester against ingratitude and tent themselves with death. Of all the horses where we have tame good and good store, of all the treasures in this field achieved and city, we render you the tenth. I thank you, General, but cannot make my heart consent to take a bribe to pay my sword. I do refuse it and stand upon my common part with those that have beheld the doing. May these same instruments which you profane never sound more. When drums and trumpets shall in the field prove flatterers, let courts and cities be made all of false-faced soothing. When steel grows soft as the parasite silk, let him be made an overture for the wars. And no more, I say. Who modest are you? More cruel to your good report than grateful to us that give you truly. Therefore, be it known as to us, to all the world, that Caius Martius wears this war, war's garland. And in token of the witch, my noble steed known to the camp, I give him with all the applause and clamor of the host, Martius Caius Coriolanus. Bear thy addition nobly ever. I will go wash, and when my face is fair, you shall perceive whether I blush or no. Howbeit, I thank you. I mean to stride your steed, and at all times to undercrest your good addition to the fairness of my power. So, to our tent, where ere we do repose us, we will write to Rome of our success. You, T Titus Larcius, must to Coriolis back. Send us to Rome the best with whom we may articulate for their own good and ours. I shall, my lord. If the gods begin to mock me, I that now refuse most princely gifts am bound to beg of my lord general. Baked, tis yours. I sometime lay here in Coriolis at a poor man's house. He used me kindly. He cried to me, I saw him prisoner. But then Orphidius was within my view and wrath uh, whelmed my pity. I request you to give my poor host freedom. Oh, well begged. Were he the butcher of my son, he should be as free as is the wind. Deliver him, Titus. Martius, his name. Oh, by Jupiter, forgot. 
I am weary. Yea, my memory is tired. Have we no wine here? Go we to our tent. The blood upon your visage dries. Tis time it should be looked to. Come. One ten, Karyles, the Volskian camp. The town is taken. It will be delivered back on good condition. Condition? Huh. I would I were a Roman, for I cannot, being a Volsky, be that I am. Condition? What good condition can a treaty find in the part that is at mercy? Five times. Martius, I have fought with thee. So oft hast thou beat me, and wouldst do so, I think, should we encounter as often as we eat. By the elements, if e'er I meet him beard to beard, he is mine, or I am his. Mine emulation hath not that honour in it it had. For where I thought to, to crush him in an equal force, sword to sword, I'll potch at him some way, or wrath, or, or craft may get him. He's the devil. Bolder, though not so subtle. My valour's poisoned with only suffering stained by him, for him shall fly out of itself, nor, nor sleep, nor sanctuary, being naked. Sick, nor fain, nor capital, the prayers of priests, nor times of sacrifice, embarkments all of fury, shall lift up their rotten privilege and custom against my hate to Martius. Go thee to the city, learn how tis held, and what they are that must be hostages to Rome. Will not you go? I'm attended at the Cypress Grove. Bring me word thither how the world goes, that I may pace of it my spur on the journey. I shall, sir. To one, Rome, a public place. In what enormity is Martius pouring that you two have not in abundance? He's poor in no one fault, but stored with all. Especially in pride. And topping all others in boasting. You blame Martius for being proud. We do it not alone, sir. Uh, I know you can do very little alone, for your helps are many. Your abilities are too infant-like for doing much alone. You talk of pride. Oh, that you could turn your eyes toward an interior survey of your good selves. Oh, that you could. What then, sir? Why, then you would discover a brace of unmeriting, proud, violent, testy magistrates, alias fools, as any in Rome. Menaeus, you are well enough known to. I am known to be a humorous patrician, and one that loves a cup of hot wine with not a drop of a laying Tiber in it. One that converses more with the buttock of the night than with the forehead <laughs> of the morning. If you see this in the map of my microcosm, follows it that I am well known enough to? Come, sir, come, we know you well enough. You know neither me, yourselves, nor anything. When you are hearing a matter between party and party, all the peace you make is calling both the parties knaves. Come, come, you are well understood to be a perfecter jiver for the table than a necessary bencher in the capital. Our very priests must become mockers if they shall encounter such ridiculous subjects as you are. <laughs> Yet you must be saying that Martius is proud. I will be bold to take my leave of you. <laughs> uh, how now, my as fair as noble ladies, and the moon, were she earthly, no nobler, whither do you follow your eyes so fast? 
Honourable Menenius, my boy Martius approaches. Ah, Martius coming home. Is he not wounded? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he is wounded. <laughs> I thank the gods for it. So do I, too, if it be not too much. Brings a victory in his pocket, the wounds become him. On his brows. <laughs> Menenius, he comes the third time home with the oaken garland. <laughs> Has he disciplined Orphidius soundly? Titus Lartius writes they fought together, but Orphidius got off. And was time for him too, I'll warrant him that. And he had stayed by him. I would not have been so fidious for all the chests in Coriolis <laughs> and the gold that's in them. Is the Senate possessed of this? Uh, good ladies, let's go. Yes, yes, yes. The Senate has letters from the general wherein he gives my son the whole name of the war. He hath oh. in this action outdone his former deeds doubly. <laughs> There's wondrous things spoke of him. Wondrous, I, I warrant you, and not without his true purchasing. Gods grant them true. True. <laughs> uh, true, I'll be sworn they are true. Where is he wounded? In the shoulder and in the left arm. Mm. There will be large cicatrices to show the people when he shall stand for his place. <laughs> he wow. had, before this last expedition, 25 wounds upon him. Well, now it's 27, and yeah. every gash was an enemy's grave. Mm. Yeah. Hark the trumpets! These are the ushers of Martius. Before him he carries noise, and behind him he leaves tears. Death, <laughs> that dark spirit in his nervy arm doth fly, which being advanced, declines, and then men die. Know, Rome, that all alone Martius did fight within Coriolis gates, where he hath won with fame a name to Martius Caius. These in honor follows Coriolanus! <gasps> Welcome to Rome. Renowned Coriolanus. Welcome to Coriolanus. No more of this. It does offend my heart. Pray now, no more. Look, sir, your mother. Oh, you have, I know, petitioned all the gods for my prosperity. <laughs> Nay, my good soldier, up. My gentle Marcius, worthy Cassius, and by deed achieving on a newly named, uh, what is it, Coriolanus, must I call thee? But oh, thy wife. <laughs> uh, my gracious silence, hail. Wouldst thou have laughed had I come coffined home that weeps to see me triumph? Ah, oh, my dear, such eyes the widows in Coriolis wear, and mothers that lack sons. <laughs> Now the gods crown thee. And live you yet. Oh, my <laughs> sweet lady, pardon. I know not where to turn. Oh, welcome home and welcome, general. And you're all welcome all. <laughs> A hundred thousand welcomes. I could weep <laughs> and I could laugh. By the faith of men, We've some old crab trees here at home that will not be grafted to your relish. Yet welcome, warriors. We call a nettle but a nettle, and the faults of fools but folly. Ever right. Menenius, ever, ever. <laughs> Give way there and go on. Your hand. And yours. Ere in our own house I do shade my head, the good patricians must be visited, from whom I have received not only greetings, but with them change of honours. I have lived to see inherited my very wishes and the buildings of my fancy. Only there's one thing wanting, 
which I doubt not but our Rome will cast upon thee. No, good mother, I had rather be their servant in my way than sway with them in theirs. On to the capital. All tongues speak of him and the bleared sights a spectacle to see him. Our veiled dames commit the war of white and damask in their nicely gorded cheeks to the wanton spoil of Phoebus' burning kisses. Such a puffer, as if that whatsoever god who leads him was slyly crept into his human powers and gave him graceful posture. On this sudden I warrant him consul. Then our office may during his power go sleep. He cannot temporarily transport his honours from where he should begin and end, but will lose those he hath won. In that there's comfort. Doubt not the commoners for whom we stand, but they upon their ancient malice will forget with the least cause these new honours, which that he give, give them make I as little question as he is proud to do it. I heard him swear, were he to stand for consul, never would he appear in the marketplace, nor on him put the napless vesture of humility, nor showing as the manner is his wounds to the people, beg their stinking breaths. Uh, Tis right. We must suggest the people in what hatred he still hath held them. That his power, he would have made them mules, silenced their pleaders, and dispropertied their freedoms, who have their provend only for bearing burdens and sore blows for sinking under them. What's the matter? You are sent for to the capital, tis thought that Marcia shall be consul. I have seen the dumb men throng to see him, and the blind to hear him speak. Matrons flung gloves, ladies and maids their scarves and handkerchiefs upon him as he passed. The nobles bended as to Jove's statue, and the commons made a shower and a thunder with their caps and shouts. I never saw the like. Let's to the capital, and carry with us ears and eyes for the time, but hearts for the event. Have with you. To Rome, the capital. Come, come, they're almost here. How many stands for consulships? Uh, three, they say. But tis thought of everyone, Coriolanus will carry it. Hmm, that's a brave fellow, but he is vengeance proud and loves not the common people. <laughs> Faith, there have been many great men that have flattered the people who ne'er loved them. He seeks their head with greater devotion than they can render it him, and leaves nothing undone that they may fully discover him their opposite. He hath deserved worthily of his country, and his ascent is not by such easy degrees as those who, having been supple and courteous to the people, without any further deed to have them at all into their estimation and report. But he hath so planted his honours in their eyes and his actions in their hearts that for their tongues to be silent and not confess so was such a kind of ingrateful injury. No more of him. He's a worthy man. Make way, they are coming. Having determined of the Volskis and to send for Titus Lartius, it remains, as the main point of this hour after meeting, to gratify his noble service that hath thus stood for his country, to report a little of that worthy work performed by Martius Caius Coriolanus whom we met here both to thank and to remember with honours like himself. Speak, good Cominius, leave nothing out for length. Master of the people, we do request your kindest ears and after your loving motion to all the common body to yield what passes here. We are convented upon a pleasing treaty and have hearts inclinable to honour and the theme of our assembly. Which the rather we shall be blessed to do, if he remember a kinder value of the people that he hath here to prize them at. Menenius, I hear thee not. 
That's off. That's off. I would you rather had been silent. Please you to hear Cominius speak. Most willingly, but yet my caution was more pertinent than the rebuke he gave it. He loves your people, but tie him not to be their bedfellow. Worthy Cominius, speak. Nay, keep your place. Sit, Coriolanus. Never shame to hear what you have nobly done. Your honour's pardon. I'd rather have my wounds to heal again than hear say how I got them. Sir, I hope my words dispensed you not. No, sir. Yet oft, when blows have made me stay, I fled from words. You soothed not, therefore hurt not. But your people, I love them as they weigh. Pray now, sit down. I had rather have one scratch my head in the sun when the alarum was struck than idly sit to hear my nothings monstered. Masters of the people, your multiplying spawn, how can he flatter? That's a thousand to one, good one, when now you see he'd rather venture all his limbs for honour than one on's ears to hear it. Proceed, Cominius. I shall lack voice. The deeds of Coriolanus should not be uttered feebly. It is held that valour is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the haver. If it be, the man I speak of cannot in the world be singly counterpoised. At 16 years, when Tarquin made a head for Rome, he fought beyond the mark of others. Tarquin's self he met and struck him on his knee. In that day's feats, when he might act the woman in the scene, he proved best man in the field, and for his meed was brow bound with the oak. And in the burnt of 17 battles since, he lurched all swords of the garland. For this last, before and in Coriolis, let me say, I cannot speak him home. His sword, death's stamp, where it did mark, it took. From face to foot, he was a thing of blood whose every motion was timed with dying cries. Alone he entered the mortal gates of the city, which he painted with shunless destiny. Aidless came off, and with a sudden reinforcement struck Coriolis like a planet. Until we called both field and city ours, he never stood to ease his breast with panting. Worthy man, he cannot but with measure feed the honors which we devise him. Our spoils he kicked at and looked upon things precious as they were the common muck of the world. He covets less than misery itself would give. He's right, noble. Let him be called for. Call Coriolanus. He doth appear. The Senate, Coriolanus, are well pleased to make the consul. I do owe them still my life and services. It then remains that you do speak to the people. I do beseech you, let me o'erleap that custom, for I cannot put on the gown, stand naked and entreat them for my wound's sake to give their suffrage. Sir, the people must have their voices, neither will they bait one jot of ceremony. It is a part that I shall blush in acting, and might well be taken from the people. Mark you that. To brag unto them, thus I did, and thus. Show them the unaching scars which I should hide, as if I had received them for the hire of their breath only. Do not stand upon it. We recommend to you, tribunes of the people, our purpose to them, and to our noble consul, wish we all joy and honour. To Coriolanus, come all joy and honour. You see how he intends to use the people. May they perceive his intent. He will require them as he did contend when he requested should be in them to give. Come, we'll inform them of our proceedings here on the marketplace. I know they do attend us. Two, three, Rome, the Forum. Once, if he 
do require our voices, we ought not to deny him. Uh, we may, sir, if we will. Mm-hmm. He show us his wounds and tell us his deeds. We are to put our tongues into those wounds and speak for them. So if he tell us his noble deeds, we must also tell him our noble acceptance of them. Ingratitude is monstrous, and for the multitude to be ingrateful would to make a monster of the multitude, of the which we being members should bring ourselves to be monstrous members. <laughs> are you all resolved to give your voices? That's no matter. The greater part carries it, I say. If he would incline to the people, there was never a worthier man. And here he comes. And in the gown of humility, mark his behaviour. He's to make his request by particulars, wherein every one of us has a single honour in giving him our own voices with our own tongues. Therefore, follow me, and I'll direct you how you shall go by him. Oh, uh, sir... You are not right. Have you not known? The worthiest men have done it. What must I say? I pray, sir, plague upon I cannot bring my tongue to such a pace. Look, sir, my wounds. I got them in my country's service when some certain of your brethren roared and ran from the noise of the drums. Oh, oh me, the gods. You must not speak of that. You must desire them to think upon you. Think upon me, hang them. I would they would forget me like the virtues which our divines lose by them. Your ma, all. I'll leave you. Pray you speak to him. I pray you in wholesome manner. Bid them wash their faces and keep their teeth clean. Oh. So here comes a brace. You know the cause, sir, of my standing here. We do, sir. Tell us what hath brought you to it. Mine own desert. Your own desert? Aye, not mine own desire. How not your own desire? No, sir, it was never my desire to trouble the poor with begging. You must think, if we give you anything, we hope to gain by you. Well then, I pray your price of the consulship. A price is to ask it kindly? Kindly, sir. I pray, let me hat. I have wounds to show you, which shall be yours in private. Your good voice, sir. What say you? You shall have it worthy, sir. A match, sir. There's in all two worthy voices begged. I have your arms, and you. This is something odd. I wouldn't try to give it again, but it is no matter. Pray you now, if I may stand with the tune of your voices, that I may be consul. I have here the customary gown. You have deserved nobly of your country, and you have not deserved nobly. Your enigma? <laughs> you have been a scourge to her enemies. You have been a rod to her friends. You have not indeed loved the common people. You should account me the more virtuous that I have not been common in my love. I will, sir, flatter my sworn brother, the people, to earn a dearer estimation of them. It is a condition they account gentle. Therefore, beseech you, I may be counsel. We hope to find you our friend, and therefore give you our voices heartily. You have received many wounds for your country. I will not seal your knowledge by showing them. I will make much of your voices, and so uh, trouble you no further. The gods give you joy, sir, heartily. Most sweet voices. Better it is to die, better to starve, than crave the hire which first we do deserve. Why, in this wolvish tongue, should I stand here to beg of hob and dick that should appear? Their needless vouches. Custom calls me to it. What custom wills? In all things we should do it, the mountainous error being too highly heaped for truth to appear. Rather than fool it so, let the high office and honour go to one that would do thus. I am half through. The one part suffered, the other will I do. Oh, here come more voices. Your voices! For your voices I have fought. 
watched for your voices, for your voices bear of wounds two dozen odd, battles thrice six I have seen and heard of, for your voices have done many things, some less, some more. Your voices? Indeed, I would be consul. He's done nobly and cannot go without any honest man's voice. Therefore, let him be consul. The gods give him joy and make him good friend to the people. Amen. 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 God, God save thee, noble save consul. Noble consul. Worthy voices. You have stood your limitation. Is this done? Now the custom of request you have discharged. The people do admit you and are summoned to meet anon upon your approbation. Where? At the Senate House? There, Coriolanus. May I change these garments? You may, sir. Then I'll straight do, and knowing myself again, repair to the Senate House. I'll keep you company. Will you along? We stay here for the people. Fare you well. He has it now, and by his looks, methinks, tis warm at his heart. With a proud heart he wore his humble weeds. Will you dismiss the people? Uh, how now, my masters, have you chose this man? He has our voices, sir. We pray the gods he may deserve your loves. <laughs> Amen, sir. To my poor unworthy notice, he mocked us when he begged our voices. Yeah. Certainly he flouted us downright. Hmm. No, tis his kind of speech he did not mock us. Uh, not one amongst us, save yourself, but says he used us scornfully. He should have showed us his marks of merit. Yeah. His wounds received for his country. Why, so he did, I am sure. No. 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 <laughs> he said he had wounds, which he could show in private. And I would be consul, says he, age and custom, but by your voices will not so permit me. Your voices, therefore. And when we granted that, he was, I thank you for your voices. Thank you. Your most sweet voices. Now that you've left your voices, I have no further with you. Was not this mockery? Why, either were you ignorant to see it, or seeing it, of such childish friendliness to yield your voices? Could you not have told him as you were lessened? When he had no power, he was your enemy. Ever spake against your liberties and the charges that you bear in the body of the wheel. And now arriving a place of potency in the sway of the state, if he should still malignantly remain far flow to the previli, your voices might be curses to yourselves. Did you perceive he did solicit you in free contempt when he did need your loves? And do you think that his contempt shall not be bruising to you when he hath power to crush? Why have your bodies no heart among you, or had your tongues to cry against the rectorship of judgment? Have you ere now denied the asker, and now again of him that did not ask but mock, bestow your suit for tongues? Not confirmed. We may deny him yet. And we'll deny him all at 500 voices of that sound. Yes! By yes. mm. twice 500 and their you friends to pieces. Instantly, yes. Yes. Mm. chose a consul that will from them take their liberties, make of them oh. no more than dogs that are as often beat for barking as therefore kept to do so. Let them assemble and on a safer judgment all revoke your ignorant election. Enforce his pride and his old hate upon you. Besides, forget not with what contempt he wore the humble weed, how in his suit he scorned you, but your loves, thinking upon his services, took from you the apprehension of his present portents, which most jibingly, ungravely, he did fashion after the inveterate hate he bears you. Mm -hmm. Lay a fault on us, your tribunes, that we labored no impediment between, but that you must, Cast your election on him. Say you chose him more after our commandment than as guided by your own true affections, and that your minds, preoccupied with what you rather must do than what you should, made you against the grain to voice and consul. Lay the blame on us. I spare us not. Say I we read spare us not. Say we read lectures to you. Say you ne'er had done it. Harp on that still, but by our putting on, and presently, when you have drawn your number, repair to the capital. <laughs> we, we will so. We will so. I will start repenting their election. Let them go on. This mutiny were better put in hazard than stay, passed out for greater. 
if, as his nature is, he fall in rage with their refusal, both observe and answer the vantage of his power. Uh, to the capital come. We will be there before the stream of the people, and this shall seem, as partly it is, their own, which we have goaded. Onwards. 3-1, Rome, the street. Saw you, Orphidius. On safeguard he came to me, and did curse against the Volskis, for they had so vilely yielded the town. He is retired to Antium. Spoke he of me? He did, my lord. How, what? How often he had met you, sword to sword, that of all things upon the earth he hated your person the most, that he would pawn his fortunes to hopeless restitution, so he might be called your vanquisher. At Antium lives he? At Antium. I wish I had a cause to seek him there. To oppose his hatred fully. Welcome home. Behold, these are the tribunes of the people, the tongues of a common mouth. I do despise them. Pass no further. Huh? What is that? It will be dangerous to go on no further. What makes this change? Atta? Has he not passed the noble and the common? Herminius, no. Have I had children's voices? Tribunes give way, he shall to the marketplace. The people are incensed against him. Stop, or all will foil and broil. Are these your herd? Must these have voices that can yield them now and straight disclaim their tongues? Be calm. Be calm. It is a purposed thing and grows by plot to curb the will of the nobility. Curb not a plot. The people cry you mock them. And of late, when corn was given them gratis, you repined. Scandaled the suppliants for the people, called them time pleasers, flatterers, foes to nobleness? Why, this was known before. Not to them all. Have you informed them, Sithens? How? I inform them. You're likely to do such business. Not unlike each way to better yours. Why then should I be consul? By yon clouds, let me deserve so ill as you and make me your fellow tribute. You show too much of that for which the people stir. Let's be calm. The people are abused, set on. This paltering becomes not Rome, nor has Coriolanus deserved this so dishonored rub. Tell me of corn. This was my speech, and I will speak it again. Not now, not now. Not in this heat, sir, now. Now, as I live, I will. My nobler friends, I crave their pardons. For the mutable, rank-scented many, let them regard me as I do not flatter, and therein behold themselves. I say again, in soothing them, we nourish against our Senate the cockle of rebellion, insolence, sedition, which we ourselves have ploughed for, sowed, and scattered. By mingling them with us, the honoured number, who lack not virtue, no, nor power, but that which they have given to beggars. Well, no, no more. No more words, we beseech you. How, no more? As for my country, I have shed my blood, not fearing outward force, so shall my lungs coin words till their decay against those measles which we disdain should tetter us, yet sought the very way to catch them. You speak of the people as if you were a god to punish, not a man of their infirmity. For well we let the people know it. What, what, his collar? Collar? Were I as patient as the midnight sleep, by Jove, twould be my mind. It is a mind that shall remain a poison where it is, not poison any further. Shall remain. Hear you, this triton of the minnows. Mark you, his absolute shall. From the cannon. Shall! Oh, good but most unwise patricians. Why, you grave but reckless senators, have you thus given Hydra here to choose an officer that with his peremptory shall wants not spirit to say he'll turn your current in a ditch and make your channel his? You are plebeians, if they be senators, and they are no less. When both your voices blended, the greatest taste most palates theirs. They choose their magistrate, and such a one is he who puts his shall, his popular shall, against a graver bench than ever frowned in Greece. My soul aches to know when two authorities are up, 
neither supreme, how soon confusion may enter twixt the gap of both and take the one by the other. Well, on to the marketplace. Whoever gave that counsel to give forth the corn of the storehouse gratis, as t'was used some time in Greece. Well, well, no more of that. One day the people had more absolute power. I say they nourished disobedience, fed the ruin of the state. Why shall the people give one that speaks thus their voice? I'll give my reasons more worthier than their voices. They know the corn was not our recompense. Resting well assured, they ne'er did service for it. Being pressed to the war, even when the navel of the state was touched, they would not thread the gates. This kind of service did not deserve corn gratis. Let deeds express what's like to be their words. We did request it. We are the greater pole, and in true fear they gave us our demands. Thus we debase the nature of our seats and make the rabble call our cares fears, which will in time break open the locks of the Senate and bring in the crows to peck the eagles. Come um, enough. Enough with overmeasure. No, take more. What may be sworn by both divine and human, seal what I end withal. This double worship, where one part does disdain with cause, the other insult without all reason, where gentry, title, wisdom cannot conclude but by the yea and no of general ignorance, it must omit real necessities and give way the while to unstable slightness. At once pluck out the multitudinous tongue, let them not lick the sweet which is their poison. Your dishonour mangles true judgment and bereaves the state of that integrity which should become it, not having the power to do the good it would for the ill which doth control it. He said enough. Has spoken like a traitor and shall answer as traitors do. Thou wretch, despite overwhelm thee. What should the people do with these bald tribunes? On whom, depending, their obedience fails to the greater bench? In a rebellion, when what's not meet but what must be was law, then were they chosen. In a better hour, let what is meet be said, it must be meet, and throw their power in the dust! Manifest treason! This a consul, no! The Edile, ho! Let him be apprehended! Go call the people, in whose name myself attach thee as a traitorous innovator, a foe to thy public will. Hence, old oh goat, hence, rotten thing, or I shall shake thy bones out of thy gut. Now peace in his arms. Both oh, sides, more respect. He is he that would take from you all your power. Seize him, Edile! Down, Down with him! No. Down with him! Down with him! Down with him! Down with him. Peace, 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 peace! Stay! Oh, peace! Hear me! People! Peace! Peace! Speak! 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 You are at point to lose your liberties. Martius would have all from you. Martius, whom late you have named for consul. Fie, fie, fie! This is the way to kindle, not to quench. To unbuild the city and to lay all flat. What is the city but the people? Yes! Oh, oh, the people are the city. Yes! By the of all, we were established the people's magistrates. Yes! yes! So remain. And so I like to do. That is the way to lay the city flat, to bring the roof to the foundation and bury all yet which distinctly ranges in heaps and piles of ruin. This deserves death! No. Or well, let us stand to our authority or let us lose it. We do here pronounce upon the part of the people in whose yes. house we were elected theirs, Martius is worthy of present death. Therefore, yes. lay hold of him, bear him to the rock Tarpeian, and from thence into destruction cast him. Edile, yes. seize him! Yield, Martius! Yield! 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 Him and bear him to the rock! No, I'll die here. <sighs> There's some among you have beheld me fighting. Come, 
try upon yourselves what you have seen me. Down with that sword. Tribunes, withdraw a while. Lay hands upon him. Down with 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 him. Young and old. Go. Get you to your house. Be gone. Away. All will be naught else. Get you gone. Stand fast. We have as many enemies as friends. Shall it be put to that? The gods forbid. I pray thee, noble friend. Home to my house. I would they were barbarians, as they are, though in Rome littered, not Romans, as they are not, though carved in the porch of the capital. Be gone. Put not your worthy rage into your tongue. One time will owe another. On fair ground, I could be forty of them. Will you hence, before the tag return, whose rage doth rend like interrupted waters, and or bear what they are used to bear? Pray you be gone. This man has marred his fortune. His nature is too noble for the world. What his breast forges, that his tongue must vent. And being angry, dost forget that ever he heard the name of death. Here's goodly work. I would they were a bed. I would they were in Tiber. Where is this viper that would depopulate this city and be every man himself? You worthy tribunes. He shall be thrown down the Tarpeian rock with rigorous hands. He hath resisted law, and therefore law shall scorn him further trial than the severity of the public power which he so sets at naught. He shall well know the noble tribunes are the people's mouths, and yes. we their hands. Yes. Yes. He shall shant. Hear me speak. As I do know the consul's worthiness, so can I name his faults. What consul? Consul what? The consul, Coriolanus. He? No. 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 If, no! No! If, if, by the tribune's leave and yours, good people, I may be heard, I'd crave a word or two, the which shall turn you to no further harm than so much loss of time. Speak briefly then, for we are peremptory to dispatch this viperous traitor. Now the traitor. good gods forbid that our renowned Rome should now eat up her own? He's a disease that must be cut away. What cut has away. he done to Rome that's worthy death? Killing our enemies? We'll hear no more. Pursue him to his house and pluck him thence, lest his infection being of catching nature spread further. Proceed <laughs> by process. Lest parties, as he is beloved, break out and sack great Rome with Romans. If it was so. What do ye talk? Have we not had a taste of his obedience? Our idols smote, ourselves resisted, come. Consider this. He has been bred in the wars since I could draw a sword and is ill-schooled in bolted language. Meal and bran together he throws without distinction. Give me leave. I'll go to him and undertake to bring him where he shall answer by a lawful form in peace to his utmost peril. Noble tribunes, it is the humane way. The other course will prove too bloody and the end of it unknown to the beginning. Noble Menenius, hmm. be you then as the people's officer. Masters, lay down your weapons. Go not home. Meet on the marketplace, we'll attend you there. Where, if you bring not Martius, we'll proceed in our first way. I'll bring yes. him to you. Mm -hmm. Let me desire your company. He must come, or what is worse will follow. Pray, let's to him. 3 2 Rome, Coriolanus House. 
Let them pull about mine ears. Present me death on the wheel, or at wild horses' heels, or pile ten hills on the Tarpeian rock, that the precipitation might downstretch below the beam of sight. Yet will I still be thus to them. You do the nobler. Please, my mother does not approve me further, who was wont to call them woolen vassals, things created to buy and sell with groats. To show bare heads in congregations, to yawn, be still, and wonder when one but of my ordinance stood up to speak of peace or war. I talk of you. Why did you wish me milder? Would you have me false to my nature? Rather say I play the man I am. Oh, sir, sir, sir. I would have had you put your power well on before you had worn it out. Let go. You might have been enough the man you are with striving less to be so. Let them hang. I let them burn too. Come, come, you've been too rough, something too rough. You must return and mend it. There's no remedy. Unless by not so doing our good city cleave in the midst and perish. Pray be counselled. I have a heart as little apt as yours, but yet a brain that leads my use of anger to better vantage. Well said, noble woman. What must I do? Return to the tribunes. Well, what then? What then? Repent what you have spoke. For them, I cannot do it to the gods. Must I then do it to them? You are too absolute, though therein you can never be too noble but when extremities speak. I have heard you say, honour and policy, like unsevered friends in the war, do grow together. Grant that, and tell me in peace what each of them by the other lose, that they combine not there. Tush, tush. A good demand. If it be honour in your wars to seem the same you are not, which for your best ends you adopt your policy, how is it less or worse that it shall hold companionship in peace with honour as in war, since that to both it stands in like request? Why force you this? Because that, that now it lies you on to speak to the people, not by your own instruction, but with such words that are but roted in your tongue though but bastards and syllables of no allowance to your bosom's truth. Now, this no more dishonours you at all than to take in a town with gentle words which else would put you to your fortune and the hazard of much blood. I would dissemble with my nature, where my fortunes and my friends at stake required I should do so in honour. I am in this, your wife, your son, these senators, the nobles, and you will rather show our general louts how you can frown than spend a fawn upon them for the inheritance of their loves and safeguard of what that want might ruin. Noble lady, come go with us, speak fair. You may salve so, not what is dangerous present, but the loss of what is past. Now, my son, go to them, thy knee, Bussing the stones, <laughs> for in such business action is eloquence and the eyes of the ignorant more learned than the ears, mm. and say to them, thou art their soldier, and being bred in broils, hast not the soft way which thou dost confess, were fit for thee to use as they to claim in asking their good loves. This but done, even as she speaks, why, their hearts were yours. Go and be ruled, although I know thou hadst rather follow thine enemy in a fiery gulf than flatter him in a bower. Here is Cominius. I have been at the market place, and sir, is fit you make strong party or defend yourself by calmness or by absence. All is in anger. Only fair speech. I think twill serve if he can there to frame his spirit. He must and will. Prithee now say you will and go about it. Must I go show them my unbarbed sconce? <laughs> must I, with my base tongue, give to my noble heart a lie that it must bear? To the marketplace. 
You have put me now to such a part which never I shall discharge to the life. Come, come, we'll prompt you. I prithee now, sweet son, as thou hast said, my praises made thee first a soldier, so to have my praise for this, perform a part thou hast not done before. Well, I must do it. Away, my disposition, and possess me some harlot spirit. My throat of war be turned, which quiet with my drum, into a pipe, small as an eunuch. A beggar's tongue make motion through my lips, and my armed knees, which bowed but in my stirrup, bend like his that hath received an arms. I will not do it! Lest I surcease to honour mine own truth, and by my body's action teach my mind a most inherent baseness. At thy choice, then, to beg of thee it is my more dishonour than thou of them. Come all to ruin, let thy mother rather feel thy pride than fear thy dangerous stoutness. For I mock a death with as big a heart as thou. Do as thou list, thy valiantness was mine. Thou suckst it from me. But owe thy pride thyself. Pray be content. Mother, I am going to the marketplace. Tide me no more. I'll mount to bank their loves, cog their hearts from them, and come home beloved of all the trades in Rome. Do your will. Away. The tribunes do attend you. Arm yourself to answer mildly. For they are prepared with accusations, as I hear, more strong than are upon you yet. The word is mildly. Pray you, let us go. Let them accuse me by invention. I will answer in mine honour. Aye, but mildly. Well, mildly be it then. Mildly. Three, three, Rome, the Forum. In this point, charge him home that he affects tyrannical power. What? Will he come? Coming. How accompanied? With old Benenius and those senators that always favoured him. Assemble presently the people hither, and when they hear me say, it shall be so in the right and strength of the commons, be it either for death, for fine, or banishment, then let them, if I say fine, cry fine, if death, cry death. I shall inform them. Put him to the collar straight. He hath been used ever to conquer, and to have his worth of contradiction. Being once chafed, he cannot be reined again to temperance. Then he speaks what's in his heart, and that is there which looks with us to break his neck. Well, here he comes. Calmly, I do beseech you. The honoured gods keep Rome in safety, and the chairs of justice supplied with worthy men. Wrong our large temples with the shows of peace, and not our streets with war. Amen. Amen. A noble wish. Draw near, ye people. This is audience. Man. I say peace. Hey. First, hear what? me speak. Oh, say. 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 No, say. Peace. No. Whoa. Shall I be charged no further than this present? Must all determine here? I do demand, if you submit you to the people's voices, allow their officers, and are content to suffer loss of lawful censure for such faults as should be proved upon you. I am content. Lo, citizens, he says he is content. The warlike service he has done, consider, think upon the wounds his body bears, which show like graves in the holy churchyard. No, scratches with briars, <laughs> stars to move, laughter only. Consider further that when he speaks not like a citizen, you find him like a soldier. Do not for accents for malicious sounds, mm. but as I say, such as become a soldier rather than envy you. Well, well, no more. What is the matter? That being passed for consul with full voice, I am so dishonoured that the very hour you take it off again. Answer to us. Say then, tis true, I ought so. We charge you that you have contrived to take from Rome all seasoned office and to mm -hmm. wind yourself into a power mm -hmm. tyrannical for which mm -hmm. you are a traitor it's to the traitor. people! Traitor! Traitor! traitor. 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 Your traitor. promise! The fires of the lowest hell fold in the people. <sighs> 
call me your dead traitor, thou injurious tribune. Within thine eyes sat 20,000 deaths. If thy hands clutched as many millions in thy lying tongue, both numbers, I would say, thou liest unto Whoa. thee with a voice as free as I do pray the gods. Mark you <laughs> this, people. Peace, peace. We need not put new matter to his charge. What you have seen him do and heard him speak, beating your officers, cursing yourselves, opposing laws with strokes, and here defying those whose great power must try him, even this so criminal, and in such capital kind, deserves the extremest death! Death! But since, but since he hath served well for Rome. What do you pray to service? I talk of that that know it. You? Is this the promise that you made your mother? No, I pray you. I'll know no further. Let them pronounce the steep Tarpeian death, vagabond exile, flaying. I would not buy their mercy at the price of one fair word. In the name of the people of Rome, and in the power of us, the tribunes, we even from this instant banish him, our city, in peril of precipitation from off the rock Tarpeian, never more to enter our Rome gates. In the people's name, I say, it shall be so! 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 My master, hear me! My masters and my common friends! Be sentenced, no more hearing! Let me speak! There's no more to be said, but he is banished as enemy to the people and his country. It shall be so! 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 A man cry of curse, whose breath I hate, as reek of the rotten fens, whose loves I prize as the dead carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air. I banish you! And here remain with your uncertainty. Let every feeble rumour shake your hearts. Your enemies, with nodding of their plumes, fan you into despair. Have the power still to banish your defenders, till at length your ignorance, which finds not till it feels, making but reservation of yourselves, still your own foes, deliver you as most abated captives to some nation that won you without blows despising for you the city thus i turn my back there is a world elsewhere the people's enemy is gone it's gone <laughs> exeunt Grandlings, this is your five minute interval. You now have five minutes to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves and prepare for the second half. If you have any questions for myself, the production team or our guest introducers, do let us know in the chat. Uh, otherwise, please be ready for the second half to begin at approximately 9 p.m. BST in five minutes time. In the meantime, please do like this video, subscribe to the channel, post your reactions using the hashtag show must go online and tag us at TSMG online live on Twitter or at the show must go online on Insta and Facebook. And now over to Sarah with an update from our Patreon. Hi everyone, thank you so much again to everyone who continues to support the project and for those who are new to us this evening, um, just to let you know that everyone involved in this show and uh, in and the creative team, so actors and creatives, um, do so voluntarily. So if you would like to tip your actors and creatives, please head over to our Patreon. The link is in the video description. Um, and uh, we've got a, a, couple, a name to shout out this week for new sign up. So huge thank you this week to Levi H uh, for joining us in supporting uh, this project and again thank you so much to everyone who continues to be so generous with this if you would like to sign up in exchange you will receive 
access to some fantastic exclusive content, including um, sneak peeks for the show coming up that week, um, actor vlogs um, and other exclusive interviews. So please do head over and anything you can contribute is hugely appreciated. You can also support the project through our Redbubble shop. Again, the link is in the video description. We've got some fantastic TSMGO merchandise that you can get your hands on. Um, and we also have some fabulous illustrations from Carly Sponzo, um, uh, all based on our shows. Uh, so you can get some fantastic prints with those. So all of the uh, profits from those are, go to our Patreon and are also shared with Carly. Um, so thank you so much for continuing to support us. Thank you so much, everyone. Every single donation, every single purchase really does make a world of difference. So we really, really appreciate it. Please do consider making a donation if you are able. And now I'd love to welcome our new resident interviewer, Tanvi Virmani, uh, to speak with our wonderful Elizabeth and Matthew uh, with a little interview. Thanks so much, Tanvi. Thank you, Elizabeth and Matthew, for joining us again. I loved your introduction and I would also love to know, what's it like working together like this? <laughs> Thanks so much. In fact, you've just got um, me. Oh. Matt is teaching in the other room. So oh. that's one, one sneak peek about uh, uh, what it's like <laughs> working together. We often trade off. Matt is a poet. Uh, so he comes at uh, Shakespeare and work like this for, with a poet sensibility with some uh, training in theater as well. And he trained as a classicist. I trained as a Shakespearean, so we get to trade from both sides of the fence, which means uh, heated breakfast, uh, usually among other things. Oh, and is it is it mainly Shakespeare based then when uh, your work crosses over? Um, it is often Shakespeare work, especially when I'm doing dramaturgical work. He likes to snoop in um, and sit in on rehearsals and other things like that. When he's building up a new manuscript, then I get to have my hand on some pages uh, of his book manuscripts and go back and forth. So it does go back and forth. Ah, and, and when did you start to work together? When, when did you realize, oh, our work could actually, you know, cross over quite a bit? Yeah, I, uh, we, we've recently become engaged, but we, we started dating. And I think after that, we started trading some pages and uh, working together. I think I dragged him to a couple of rehearsals when I was dramaturging for some productions. Um, and he was like, hey, this is way more fun than just writing alone on the page. I think I really <laughs> like people too. Oh, that's a great way. Yeah, that's a great way to become closer as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, what, what drew you to introducing this play in particular? Uh, I really like this uh, play a lot. It's got really interesting versification. I think Coriolanus is a really complex character. He's seductive in a lot of his arguments. He thought it seems appealing to suggest, right, that you should have to um, fight to get any of the resources that you want. I'm particularly struck by the speech when he's arguing, you know, um, if citizens don't want to join the war effort, should they have first access to corn? And in some ways, I think that appeals to sort of a merit-based argument, but that does not account for the least among us. So I mm. find him really interesting and challenging to sort of appeal to our darker sensibilities um, around meritocracy that can be really problematic um, in interesting ways. So I, I find that particularly interesting. Yeah, yeah, and he's a, he, cause he's such a, he, he's someone who's of a very high status, yet at the same time, he's so childlike, especially with his, with his mom. Yeah, isn't he just, right? It's, it, you almost kind of want to slap him. Like, how old have you been? You've been in the wars for how long? <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, and so, like, what, and on that line, like, talking about his mom and women, what, what do you, can you share with us, you know, how, how do you feel about the way Shakespeare has addressed the female presence in this play in particular? Yeah, it's a, it, Right, the women are not particularly present in this play, <laughs> as it were. No. I, mean, I think that's one of the great things about this production with all of our cross-dressing. I think that's fabulous. Um, there were 17th century adaptations that actually add female characters to this play and have a very different ending to this play, right? They really inject more women. So I think there's this sense of desire that there's clearly a female voice beyond a sort of semi-allegorical um, volumina as a kind of stand-in for Rome that doesn't really satisfy. And so we get these later adaptations on the other side of the civil wars um, that add more women who are clearly a part of the public and the people that we don't really see in this version. Mm, mm, and what, what do you think, what is that different? What, 
how does adding women to it to such a to a play that really doesn't have any women probably one of Shakespeare's plays that's the least diverse I think like what 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 do you think is like why is it so important to add women to to, to the play and what kind of effect does that give to the play as a whole Right, it's like 50% of the population, right? It's 50% of the people being impacted by the patrician voices. Uh, patrician women were very powerful, right? These sort of blue bud, um, really powerful women in ancient Rome. So in some ways you only see a very small part of Roman culture if you're trying to capture that in a production. If you don't mm -hmm. have a lot of uh, women roles and women doing political work uh, in their domestic spaces and in debate. So you do actually miss a, a piece of the puzzle of how Roman society also worked. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. It's a, uh, and also I think it just, it just adds like, just makes it more inclusive really. <laughs> <laughs> aside from like how it can add to the plot and all of that it's just yeah I I, I get what you mean yeah yeah absolutely that's right and we, we see a play that's really invested in warfare and we don't have any women sort of you know like <clears throat> having an opinion about should we go to war in what ways should we defend people who should have right uh access to food and resources which would no doubt have a very different perspective on on those sorts of decisions right so we don't see that influence in the play at all. And again, I'm, I'm very persuaded by the, the sense that um, Illumina is a kind of allegorical standard for Rome, right? Rome, Roma, right, is gendered female. Um, and that she's not even really staged as a fully developed woman at all, but some sort of um, moral ground to which he uh, defers to sort of indicate where he should go and what decisions he should make. So even in that way, the play sort of strips um, any sort of realistic or psychologically relatable women out of the play, potentially. Mm, yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. It was it was lovely to talk to you about this. Um, over to you, Rob. Thank you so much, Tambi. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was absolutely fascinating. What a wonderful boon to uh, boost us into the second half here. Uh, so, uh, gentlemen, uh, ladies, girls, gals, non-binary pals, grand links out there all over the world, the show is now about to recommence. So if I can ask you to uh, head to the backstage area, thank you so much. And uh, remember to uh, use the hashtag show must go online, tag us on social media, like this video, subscribe to the channel, all of that good stuff, and prepare to enjoy the second half of William Shakespeare's Coriolanus. For one, Rome, the gates. Come, leave your tears, a brief farewell. The beast with many heads butts me away. Nay, mother, where is your ancient courage? You used to say that common chances common men could bear, that when the sea was calm, all boats alike showed mastership in floating to load me with precepts that would make me invincible, the heart that conned them. Oh, heavens, oh, heavens. Hey, I prithee, woman. Now the red pestilence strike all trades in Rome and occupations perish. What, what, what? I shall be loved when I am lacked. Nay, mother, resume that spirit when you were wont to say, if you had been the wife of Hercules, six of his labors you'd have done and saved your husband so much sweat. <laughs> Cominius, droop not, <clears throat> adieu. Farewell, my wife, my mother. I'll do well yet. Thou old and true Menenius, thy tears are salter than a younger man's and venomous to thine eyes. Tell these sad women, tis fond to wail inevitable strokes as, is, as tis to laugh at them. My first son, whither wilt thou go? Take good Cominius with thee a while. I'll follow thee a month. Thou hast years upon thee, and thou art too full of the war's surfeits to go rove with one that's yet unbruised. While I remain above the ground, you shall hear from me still, and never of me aught but what is like me formerly. That's worthily, as any ear can hear. Give me thy hand. Come. For two, Rome, a street. Uh, bid them, bid them. He's gone and we'll know further. 
Let the nobility are vexed whom we see have sided in his behalf. Now we have shown our power, let us seem humbler after it is done than what it was a doing. Here comes his mother. Oh, you're well met. The hoarded plague of the gods requite your love. Peace, peace, be not so loud. If that I could for weeping, you should hear, nay, and you shall hear some. Will you be gone? You shall stay too. I would I had the power to say so to my husband. Are you mankind? Aye, fool, is that a shame? Note but this fool was not a man, my father. Hadst thou fox ship to banish him that struck more blows for Rome than thou hast spoken words? Oh, blessed heavens! More noble blows than ever thou wise words, and for Rome's good. I would he had continued to his country as he began, and not unknit himself the noble knot he made. I would he had. I would he had. T'was you incensed the rabble. Cats that can judge as fitly of his worth as I can of those mysteries which heaven will to earth to know. Pray, let's go. Now pray, sir, get you gone. You have done a brave deed. Ere you go, hear this. As far as doth the capital exceed the meanest house in Rome, so far, my son, this lady's husband here, this, do you see, whom you have banished, does exceed you all. Well, well, we'll leave you. You have told them home, and by my troth, of course, you'll sup with me? Angers, my meat. I'll sup upon myself, and so shall starve with feeding. Come, let's go. Leave this faint puling and lament as I do in anger, Juno-like. Come, come, come. Fie, fie, fie. Four three, the road to Antium. I know you. Well, sir, and you know me. Your name, I think, is Adrian. It is so, sir. Truly, I have forgot you. I am a Roman, and my services are as you are against them. What's the news in Rome? The main blaze of it is Pat. Oh, there hath been in Rome strange insurrections. The people against the senators, patricians, and nobles. Hath been. Is it ended then? The main blaze of it is past, but a small thing would make it flame again. For the nobles receive so to the hearts the banishment of that worthy Coriolanus, that they are in a ripe aptness to take all power from the people and pluck from them their tribunes forever. Coriolanus banished. Banished, sir. You will be welcome with this intelligence, Nine Kinor. Your noble Tullus Aphidius will appear well in these wars, his great oppressor Cori opposer Coriolanus being now in no request of his country. <laughs> he cannot choose. I am most fortunate thus accidentally to encounter you. You have ended my business here, and I will merrily accompany you home. I shall, between this and supper, tell thee most strange things from Rome, all tending to the good of their adversaries. Have you an army ready, say you? A most royal one. I am joyful to hear of their readiness, and am the man, I think, that shall set them in present action. So, sir, heartily well met, and most glad of your company. <laughs> you take my part from me, sir. I have the most cause to be glad of yours. Well, let's go together. Four, four, Antium. A goodly city is this Antium. City, tis I that made thy widows. Many an heir of these fair edifices, for my wars have I heard groan and drop. Save you, sir. And you? Direct me, if it be your will, where great Ophidius lies. Is he in Antium? He is, and feasts the nobles of the state at his house this night. Which is his house, beseech you? Uh, this here before you. Ah, thank you, sir. Farewell. Oh, world, thy slippery turns. So with me. 
my birthplace hate I, and my love's upon this enemy town. I'll enter. If he slay me, he does fair justice. If he give me way, I'll do his country service. Four five, Aphidius House. Wine! 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 What service is here? I think our fellows are asleep. Where is Cotus? Oh, my master calls for him. Cotus! A goodly house, a feast smells well, but I appear not like a guest. What would you have, friend? When saw you? Here's no place for you. Break out to the door. I have deserved no better entertainment in being Coriolanus. And so you shall pray, get you out! What fellow's this? Strange one as ever I looked on. What are you? A gentleman. A marvellous poor one. True, so I am. Pray you, poor gentleman. Take up some other station. Here's no place for you. Follow your function. Go and button on cold bits. What? You will not? Pretty, tell my master what a strange guest he has here. And I shall. Where dwellst thou? Under the canopy. Where's that? In the city of kites and crows. In the city of kites and crows. What an ass it is. Then thou dwellst with doors too? No, I serve not thy master. How, sir? Do you meddle with my master? Aye, tis an honester service than to meddle with your mistress. Thou pratest and pratest. Serve with thy trencher. Hence! Where is this fellow? Yes, sir. I'd have beaten him like a dog, but I'm not disturbing the lords with him. Whence comest thou? What wouldst thou? Thy name? Why speaks not? Speak, man! What's thy name? If, Tullus, not yet thou knowst me, and seeing me does not think me for the man I am, necessity commands me name myself. What is thy name? A name unmusical to the Volscians' ears, and harsh in sound to thine. Say, what's thy name? Thou hast a grim appearance, and thy face bears a command in it. Though thy tackle's torn, thou show'st a noble vessel. What's thy name? Prepare to brow, but prepare thy brow to frown. Know'st thou me yet? I know thee not! Thy name! My name is Caius Martius, who hath done to thee particularly, and to all the Volskis, great hurt and mischief. There to witness may my surname, Coriolanus. Only that name remains. The cruelty and envy of the people permitted by our dastard nobles, who have all forsook me, hath devoured the rest, and suffered me by the voice of slaves to be hooped out of Rome. Now this extremity hath brought me to thy hearth, not out of hope, mistake me not, to save my life, for if I had feared death of all the men of the world, I would have avoided thee. But in me a spite to be full quit of those my banishers, stand I before thee here, then if thou hast a heart of reek in thee that wilt revenge thine own particular wrongs and stop those maims of shame seen through thy country, speed thee straight and make my misery serve thy turn. Martius. Martius. Each word thou hast spoke hath weeded from my heart a root of ancient envy. Let me twine mine arms around that body, <laughs> where against my grained ash a hundred times hath broke and scarred the moon with splinters. Know thou first, I loved the maid I married, never man sighed truer breath, but that I see thee here, 
Thou noble thing. More dances my rapt heart than when I first my wedded mistress saw bestride my threshold. Thou hast beat me out twelve several times, and I have nightly since dreamt of encounters twixt thyself and me. We've been down together in my sleep, unbuckling helms, fisting each other's throats, and waked half dead with nothing. <laughs> Worthy Martius, had we no quarrel else to roam, but that thou art thence banished, we would muster all from 12 to 70 and pouring war into the bowels of ungrateful Rome like a bold flood o'er bear it. You bless me, God. Therefore, most absolute sir, if thou wilt have the leading of thine own revenges, take the one half of my commission and set down as best thou art experienced since thou knows thy country's strength and weakness, thine own ways. Whether to knock against the gates of Rome, or rudely visit them in parts remote to fight them there, destroy. <laughs> but come in, let me commend ye first to those that shall say yea to thy desires. A thousand welcomes, and more a friend than e'er an enemy, yet Martius, that was much. Your hand. Most welcome. What an arm he has! He turned me about with his finger and his thumb as one would set up a top. Yeah, I knew by his face that there was something in him. He, he had a, a kind of face, me thought. I cannot tell how to term it. He had so, looking as it were. Would I were hanged, but I, I thought there was more in him than I could think. So did I, I will be sworn. He is simply the, the rarest man in the world. Oh, slaves, I can tell you news, news, you rascals. Oh, oh, what, what, what? Why, here's he that was wont to thwack our general, Caius Martius. Why do you say thwack our general? I do not say thwack our general, but he was always good enough for him. Come, 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 we are fellows and friends. He was ever too hard for him. I've heard him say so himself. He was too hard for him, directly to say the Trothons before Coriolis. He scotched him and notched him like a carbonado. <laughs> <laughs> Why, he is so made on him within as if he were the son and heir to Mars, sat at upper end of the table, no question asked him by any of the senators, but they stand bolder before him. Our general himself makes a mistress of him, <laughs> sanctifies himself with hand, and turns up the white of the eye to his discourse. But the bottom of the news is our general is cut in the middle, and but one half of what he was yesterday, for the other has half by the entreaty and grant of the whole table. He'll go, he says, and salve a porter of Rome's gates by the ears. He will mow down all before him and leave his passage pulled. He's like to do it as any man I can imagine. Do it? He will do it, for look you, sir, he has as many friends as enemies. But when goes this forward? Tomorrow, today, presently, you shall have the drum struck up this afternoon. Tis as it were, a parcel of their feast, and to be executed ere they wipe their lips. <laughs> Why then, we shall have a stirring world again. This piece is nothing but to rust iron, increase tailors, and breed ballad makers. <laughs> in, 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 in. <laughs> Six row. Uh, we hear not of him, neither need we fear him. His remedies are tame in the present peace and quietness of the people, which before were in wild hurry. Here do we make his friends blush that the world goes well, who rather had, though they themselves did suffer by it, behold licentious numbers pestering streets, and see our tradesmen singing in their shops and going about their functions friendly.
We stood to it in good time. Uh, is this Menenius? Oh, it is he, it is he. Oh, he has grown most kind of late. Hail, sir. Hail to you both. Your Coriolanus is not much missed, but with his friends, the Commonwealth doth stand, and so would do were he more angry at it. All's well, and might have been much better, if he could have temporised. Here is he. Uh, hear you? Nay, yeah, I hear nothing. His mother and his wife hear nothing from him. Oh. God's oh, preserve God's you both. Good evening, our neighbours. Good evening to you all. Good evening to you all. Ourselves, our wives, and children on our knees are bound to pray for you both. Live and thrive. Farewell, kind neighbours. We wish Coriolanus had loved you as we did. Oh, the gods keep you. you. Farewell. 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 Uh, this is a happier and more comely time than when the fellows ran about the streets crying confusion. Caius Martius was a worthy officer in the war, but insolent, overcome with pride, ambitious past all thinking, self -loving. And affecting one's sole throne without assistance. I think not so. Oh, we should by this to all our lamentation, if he had gone forth consul, found it so. The gods have well prevented it, and Rome sits safe and still without him. Worthy tribunes, there is a slave who we have put in prison, reports that the Volskis with two several powers are entered in the Roman territories and with the deepest malice of the war destroy that lies before him. His Orphidius, who hearing of our martious banishment, thrusts forth his horns again into the world, which were in shell when Martius stood for Rome and durst not once peep out. Come, what talk you of Martius? Go and see this rumour whipped. It cannot be the Volskis dare break with us. Cannot be. We have recorded that very well it can, and three examples of the like hath been within my age. But reason with the fellow, lest you shall chance to whip your information and beat the messenger who bids beware of what is to be dreaded. Tell not me, I know this cannot be. Not possible. The nobles in great earnest are going to all are going all to the Senate House. Some news is coming that turns their countenances. Tis this slave. It is spoken freely out of many mouths. How probable, how probable, I do not know. That Martius, joined with Ophidius, leads a power against Rome and vows revenge as spacious as between the youngest and the oldest. This thing. is most likely. Praise only that the weaker sort may wish good Martius home again. Very trick on it. This is unlikely. He and Orphidius can no more atone than violentist contrariety. You are sent for to the Senate. A fearful army led by Caius Martius, associated with Ophidius, rages upon our territories and have already airborne their way, consumed with fire and took what lay before them. Oh, you have made good work. What news? What news? You have helped to ravish your own daughters and to melt the city leads upon your pates to see your wives dishonor to your noses. Pray, your news. If Martius should be joined with the Volskians. Yeah. He is their god. He leads them like a thing made by some other deity than nature that shapes men better. And they follow him against us brass with no less confidence than boys pursuing summer butterflies or butchers killing flies. You have made good work. You and your apron men, you that stood so much upon the voice of occupation and the breath of garlic eaters. You shake your Rome about your ears. You've made fair work. But is this true, sir? Aye, and you'll look pale before you find it other. We are all undone, unless the noble man have mercy. Who shall ask it? Huh? The tribunes cannot do it for shame. The people deserves such pity of him as the wolf does of the shepherds. Tis true. You and your crafts, you have crafted fair. You have brought a trembling upon Rome. Say not Say we not brought, brought it. it. 
Oh, how was we? We loved him, but like beasts and cowardly nobles gave way unto your clusters, who did hoot him out of the city. But I fear they'll roar him in again. Tullus of Phidias, the second man name of men, obeys his points as if he were his officer. Desperation is all the policy, strength, and defense that Rome can make against them. Ay, here comes the clusters. Huh. And is Orphidius with him? You are they that made the air unwholesome in hooting at Coriolanus' exile. Now he's coming, and not a hair upon a soldier's head which will not prove a whip. We have deserved it. Maybe we hear fearful we... news. For my own part, when I said I banished him, I said twas pity. <laughs> so did I. And, and so did I, and to say truth, so did very many of us. That we did, we did for the best, and though we willingly consented to his banishment, yet it was against our will. You were goodly things, you voices. You have made good work, you and your cry. Shall us to the capital. Oh, okay. what else? Go, masters, get you home. God be good to us. Come, masters, let's home. I ever said we were in the wrong when we banished him. Did we all but come, let's home? I do not like this news. Nor I. Let's to the capital. Would half my wealth would buy this for a lie. Pray, let's go. Four seven Volskian camp. Do they still fly to the Roman? I do not know what witchcraft's in him, but your soldiers use him as the grace for meat, their talk at table, and their thanks at end. And you're darkened in this action, sir, even by your own. I cannot help it now, unless by using means I lame the foot of our design. He bears himself more proudlier, even to my person, than I thought he would when first I did embrace him. Yet, his nature in that is no changeling. And I must excuse what cannot be amended. Yet I wish, sir, I mean for your particular, you would not joined in commission with him, but either have borne the action of yourself, or else to him had left it solely. I understand thee well, and be thou sure, when he shall come to his account, he knows not what I can urge against him. Sir, I beseech you, think you he'll carry Rome. All places yield to him ere he sits down, and the nobility of Rome are his. The senators and patricians love him too. The tribunes are no soldiers, and their people will be as rash in the repeal as hasty to expel him thence. I think he'll be to Rome, as is the osprey to the fish, who takes it by sovereignty of nature. When, Caius, Rome is thine, thou art poorest of all, then shortly art thou mine. Five one, Rome. Oh, I'll not go. You hear what he hath said, which was sometime his general, who loved him in a most dear particular. He called me father. But what of that? Go you that banished him a mile before his tent, fall down and knee the way into his mercy. Nay, if he coyed to hear Cominius speak, I'll keep at home. You would not seem to know me. Do you hear? Yet one time he did call me by my name. I urged our old acquaintance and the drops that we have bled together. Coriolanus he would not answer to, forbade all names. He was a kind of nothing, titleless, till he had forged himself a name of the fire of burning Rome. Why so, you have made good work. A pair of tribunes that have racked for Rome to make Cole's cheap, a noble memory. I offered to awaken his regard for his private friends. He said, 
'Twas folly for one poor grain or two to leave unburnt and still to nose the offence. For one poor grain or two. I am one of those. His mother, wife, his child, and this brave fellow too. We are the grains. You're the musty chaff. We must be burnt for you. Pray you go to him. What should I do? Only make trial what your love can do for Rome towards Martius. Well, and say that Martius return me as Cominius is returned. Unheard. What then? But as a discontented friend, grief-shot with his unkindness, say it be so. Yet your goodwill must have that thanks from Rome after the measure as you intended well. I'll undertake it. I think he'll hear me. Know the very road into his kindness, and cannot lose your way. I shall ere long have knowledge of my success. You'll never hear him. Not? I tell you, he does sit in gold, his eye red as twould burn Rome, and his injury the jailer to his pity. Hope is vain, unless... His noble mother and his wife, who, as I hear, mean to solicit him for mercy to his country. Therefore, let's hence, and with our fair entreaties, haste them on. Five two, Volsky and Kemp. Stay. Whence are you? Stand and go back. You guard like men. Tis well, but by your leave, I am an officer of state and come to speak with Coriolanus. From whence? From Rome. You may not pass, you must return. Our general will no more hear from thence. You'll see your Rome embraced with fire before you speak with Coriolanus. Good, my friends. If you have heard your general talk of Rome and of his friends there, it is lots to blanks. My name hath touched your ears. It is Menenius. Be it so. Go back. The virtue of your name is not here poss possible. I tell thee, fellow, thy general is my lover. I have been the book of his good acts, whence men have read his fame unparalleled, happily amplified. Therefore, fellow, I must have leave to pass. Faith, sir, if you had told as many lies on his behalf as you've uttered words in your own, you, would, you should not pass here. No, though it were as virtuous to lie as to live chastely. Therefore, go back. Prithee, fellow, remember my name is Menenius. Has he dined, canst thou tell? For I would not speak with him till after dinner. You are a Roman, are you? I am, as thy general is. <laughs> then you should hate Rome, as he does. Can you, when you have pushed out in her gates the very defender of them, and in a violent popular ignorance, given your enemy your shield, think to front his revenges with the palsied intercession, intercession of such a decayed dotant? as you seem to be? No, you are deceived. Therefore, back to Rome and prepare for your execution. Sirrah, if thy captain knew I were here, he would use me with estimation. <laughs> My general cares not for you. Back, I say, go. Nay, nay, but fellow, fellow. Uh, oh, What's my the son. Matter? My son, thou art preparing fire for us. Look thee, <laughs> here's water to quench it. I was hardly moved to come to thee, but being assured none but myself could move thee, I have been blown out of your gates with sighs and conjure thee to pardon Rome and thy petitionary countrymen. Away. How? Away? That we have been familiar. In great forgetfulness shall poison rather than pity note how much. Yet for I loved thee, take this along. I writ it for thy sake. And would have sent it 
Another word, Menenius, I will not hear thee speak. This man, Orphidius, was my beloved in Rome, yet thou beholdst. Keep a constant temper. <laughs> and now, sir, is your name Menenius? Tis a spell, you see, of much power. You know the way home again. Let your general do his worst. For you, be that you are long, and your misery increase with your age. I say to you, as I was said to, away. Three Coriolanus tent. We will before the walls of Rome tomorrow set down our host, my partner in this action. You must report to the Volscian lords how plainly I have borne this business. Only their ends you have respected. Stopped your ears against the general suit of Rome, never admitted a private whisper, no, not with such friends that thought they were sure of you. This last old man whom with a cracked heart I have sent to Rome, loved me above the measure of a father, nay, godded me indeed. Fresh embassies and suits, nor from the state, nor private friends, hereafter will I lend ear to. Yay! Shout is this, shall I be tempted to infringe my vow in the same time tis made? I will not. My wife comes foremost, than the honoured mould wherein this trunk was framed, and in her hand, the grandchild to her blood, but out affection, or bond and privilege of nature, break. Let it be virtuous to be obstinate. What is that curtsy worth, or those dove's eyes, which can make gods forsworn? I melt, and am not of stronger earth than others. My mother bows, as if Olympus to a molehill should in supplication nod. And my young boy hath an aspect of intercession which great nature cries deny not. My lord and husband. These eyes are not the same I wore in Rome. The sorrow that delivers us thus changed makes you think so. Like a dull actor now. I have forgot my part, and I am out, even to a full disgrace. Best of my flesh, forgive my tyranny, but do not say for that, forgive our Romans. Oh, a kiss, long as my exile, sweet as my revenge. Now, by the jealous queen of heaven, that kiss I carried from thee, dear, and my true lip hath virgined it ere since. You gods, I prate, and the most noble mother of the world, leave unsaluted, sink my knee, idiot. Of thy deep duty more impression show than that of common sons. Oh, stand up, blessed, whilst with no softer cushion than the flint, I kneel before thee. What's this? Your knees to me? To your corrected son? Then let the pebbles on the hungry beach fill up the stars. Let the multitude, mul the mutinous winds strike the proud cedars against the fiery sun, murdering impossibility to make what cannot be slight work. Thou art my warrior. I hope to frame thee. Do you know this lady? The noble sister of Publicola, a dear Valeria. And this poor epitome of yours, which by the interpretation of full time may show like all yourself. The God of soldiers, with the consent of supreme Jove, inform thy thoughts with nobleness that thou mayst prove to shame invulnerable and stick the wars like a great sea mark, standing every floor and saving those that eye thee. Your knee, Sirrah. That's my brave boy. Even he, your wife, 
this lady and myself are suitors to you. Tell me not wherein I seem unnatural. Desire not to allay my rages and revenges with your colder reasons. Oh, no more. No more. You have said you will not grant us anything, for we have nothing else to ask but that which you deny already. Orphidius and Uvolskis, mark, for we'll hear naught from Rome in private. Your request? How more unfortunate than all living women are we come hither, since that thy sight, which should make our eyes flow with joy, hearts dance with comforts, constrains them weep and shake with fear and sorrow, making the, the mother, wife and child to see the son, the husband and the father tearing his country's bowels out. And to poor we, thine enmity's most capital, thou bastest our prayers to the gods, which is a comfort that all but we enjoy. For either thou must, as a foreign recreant, be led with manacles through our streets, or else triumphantly tread on thy country's ruin and bear the palm for having bravely shed thy wife and children's blood. For myself, son, I purpose not to wait on fortune till these wars determine. If I cannot persuade thee rather to show a noble grace to both parts than to seek the end of one, thou shalt no sooner march to assault thy country than to tread, trust thou to it, thou shalt not, on thy mother's womb that brought thee to this world. I and mine that brought you forth this boy to keep your name living to time. Hey, I'll run away till I'm bigger, but then I'll fight. Not of a woman's tenderness to be requires nor child nor woman's face to see. I have sat too long. Thou knowest, great son, the end of war's uncertain, but this certain, that if thou conquer Rome, the benefit which you shall thereby reap is such a name whose repetition will be dogged with curses, whose chronicle thus writ, the man was noble, but with his last attempt he wiped it out, destroyed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age abhorred. Daughter, speak thou, he cares not for your weeping. Speak thou, boy. Perhaps thy childishness will move him more than can our reasons. There's no man in the world more bound to his mother. Yet here he lets me prate like one in the stocks. Thou hast never in thy life showed thy dear mother any courtesy, when she, poor hen, fond of no second brood, hath clapped thee to the wars and safely home, loaden with honour. Say my requests unjust and spurn me back, but if it be not so, thou art not honest, and the gods will plague thee that thou restrains from me the duty which to a mother's part belongs. He turns away. Down, ladies. Let us shame him with our knees. To his surname Coriolanus longs more pride than pity to our prayers. Down. An end. This is the last. So, we will home to Rome and die among our neighbours. Come, let's go. This fellow had a Volskian to his mother. His wife is in Coriolis and his child, like him by chance. Yet give us our dispatch. I am hushed until our city be a fire. And then I'll speak a little. Oh, mother, mother, 
what have you done? Your holes, the heavens do ope. The gods look down and this unnatural scene they laugh at. Oh, my mother, mother. Oh, you have won a happy victory to Rome. But for your son, believe it. Oh, believe it. Most dangerously you have with him prevailed, if not most mortal to him. But let it come. Ovidius, though I cannot make true wars, I'll frame convenient peace. Now, good Ovidius, were you in my stead? Would you have heard a mother less? Or granted less, Ophidius? I was moved with all. I dare be sworn you were. And sir, it is no little thing to make mine eyes to sweat compassion. But, good sir, what peace you'll make advise me. For my part, I'll not to Rome. I'll back with you and pray you stand to me in this cause. Oh, mother, wife. <laughs> I am glad thou hast set thy mercy and thy honour at difference in thee. Out of that, I'll work myself a form of fortune. Aye, by and by. But we will drink together, and you shall bear a better witness back than words, which we, on like conditions, will have countersealed. Come, enter with us. Ladies, you deserve to have a temple built you. All the swords in Italy and her confederate arms could not have made this peace. Five four, Rome. I say there is no hope, and our throats are sentenced and stay upon execution. Is it possible that so short a time can alter the condition of a man? There is difference between a grub and a butterfly, yet your butterfly was a grub. This Martius is grown from man to dragon. He loved his mother dearly. So did he me. And he no more remembers his mother now than an eight-year-old horse. He sits in his state as a, a thing made for Alexander. What he bids be done is finished with his bidding. He wants nothing of a god but eternity and a heaven to throne in. Yes, mercy, if you report him truly. I paint him in the character. Mark what mercy his mother shall bring from him. There is no more mercy in him than there is milk in a male tiger. That shall our poor city find, and all this is long of you. The gods be good unto us. No, in such a case, the gods will not be good to us. When we banished him, we respected not them. And he returning to break our necks, they respect not us. Sir, if you'd save your life, fly to your house. The plebeians have got your fellow tribune and hail him up and down, all swearing. If the Roman ladies bring not comfort home, they'll bring him death by inches. What's the news? Good news, good news. The ladies have prevailed. <laughs> the Voskians have dislodged and Marcius gone. A merrier day did never yet greet Rome. No, not the expulsion of the Tarquins. Friend, art thou certain this is true? Is it most as, certain? As certain as I know the sun is fire. Where have you lurked that you make doubt of it? Never though, never through an arc so hurry the blown tide as the recomforter through the gate. Why, oh, hark you! The trumpets set bites, south trees and fives, tabors and cymbals, and the shouting Romans make the sun dance. Yeah! This what is news? good news. I will go meet the ladies. This volumnia is worth of consuls, senators, patricians, a city full of tribunes such as you, a sea and land full. Yeah. <laughs> First, the gods bless you for your tidings. Next, accept my thankfulness. Sir, uh, we have all great cause to give great thanks. They are near the city? Almost at the point of enter. We'll meet them and help the joy. Five, 
555 Rome the Gates. Behold our patroness, the life of Rome. Call all your tribes together, praise the gods and make triumphant fires. Strew flowers before them, unshout the noise that banished Martius. Repeal him with the welcome of his mother. Cry, welcome, ladies, welcome. Welcome, welcome ladies, welcome. welcome. Five six Cariah Lins. Go tell the lords of the city I'm here. Deliver them this paper. Him I accuse the city ports by this hath entered and intends to appear before the people, hoping to purge himself with words. Dispatch. Most welcome. How is it with our general? Even so, as with a man by his own arms impoisoned and with his own charity slain. Most noble sir, if you do hold the same intent when you wished us parties, we'll deliver you of your great danger. Sir, I cannot tell. We must proceed as we define the people. The people will remain uncertain whilst twixt you there's a difference. But the fall of either makes the survivor heir of all. I know it. And my pretext to strike at him admits a good construction. I raised him. And I pawned mine honour for his truth, who being so heightened, he watered his new plants with dews of flattery, seducing so my friends. And to this end he bowed his nature, never known before but to be rough, unswayable and free. Sir, his stoutness, when he did stand for consul, which he lost by lack of stooping. That I would have spoke of. Being banished for it, he came unto my hearth presented to my knife his throat. I took him, made him joint servant with me, gave way to him in all his own desires, till at the last I seemed his follower, not partner. And he waged me with his countenance as if I had been a mercenary. So he did, my lord. The army marveled at it. And in the last, when he had carried Rome, and that we looked for no spoil, no less than glory... There was <sighs> it, for which my sinews shall be stretched upon him. At a few drops of women's room, which are as cheap as lies, he sold the blood and labour of our great action. Therefore shall he die. And I'll renew me in his fall. The heart. Your native town you entered like a post and had no welcomes home, but he returned, splitting the air with noise. And patient fools whose children he hath slain, their base throats tear with giving him glory. Therefore, at your vantage, ere he express himself or move the people with what he would say, let him feel your sword, which we will second. Say no more. Here come the lords. You're most welcome most home. Welcome home. Welcome. I have not deserved it. But, worthy lords, have you with heed perused what I have written to you? We have. We have, and grieved to hear it. What faults he made before the last. I think might have found easy finds, but there to end where he was to begin and give away the benefit of our levies, answering us with our own charge, making a treaty where there was a yielding. This admits no excuse. Well, he approaches. You shall hear him. Hail, lords, I am returned your soldier no more infected with my country's love than when I parted hence, but still subsisting under your great command. You are to know that prosperously I have attempted and with bloody passage led your wars even to the gates of Rome. Our spoils we have brought home doth more than counterpoise a full third part the charges of the action. We have made peace with no less honor to the Antiates than shame to the Romans and we here deliver, subscribed by the consuls and patricians, together with the seal of the Senate, what we have compounded on. Read it not, noble lords. 
But tell the traitor, in the highest degree, he hath abused your powers. Traitor, how now? Aye, traitor, Martius. Martius? Aye, Martius. Caius Martius. Well, dost thou think I'll grace thee with that robbery, thy stolen name, Coriolanus, in Coriolis? Your lords and heads of the state, perfidiously he hath betrayed your business and given up for certain drops of salt your city, Rome, I say your city, to his wife and mother, breaking his oath and resolution like a twisted rotten silk, never admitting counsel of the war, but at his nurse's tears he whined and roared away your victory that pages blushed at him, and men of heart looked wondering each at others. Here's thou, Mars. Name thou not the God, thou boy of tears! Aha! Uh -huh. No more! Measureless liar! Thou hast made my heart too great for what contains it. Boy! Oh, slave! Pardon me, lords, tis the first time that I've ever I was forced to scold. Your judgments, my grave lords, must give this cur the lie, and his own notion, who wears my stripes impressed upon him, that must bear my beating to his grave, shall join to thrust the lie unto him. Peace, both, and hear me speak. Cut me to pieces, Volsky. Men and lads, stain all your edges on me. Boy! False hound! If you have writ your annals true, tis there, uh, like an eagle in a dovecote, I fluttered your Volskians in Coriolis. Alone I did it! Boy! Why, noble lords, will you be put in mind of his blind fortune, which was your shame by this unholy braggart for your own eyes and ears? Let him Let's die for it. for it. Tear him to peace. Tear him to peace. Do it, do it presently. Him. Peace. Oh, no no outrage. Peace. Peace. The man is noble, and his fame folds in this orb of the earth. His last offense to us shall have judicious hearing. Stand, Aphidius, and trouble not the peace. Oh, that I had him with six Aphidiuses or more, his tribe, to use my lawful sword. Excellent villain! Kill him! Yeah. Hold! Hold! Ah. Hold! 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 My noble masters, hear me speak. Oh, tell us. Thou hast done a deed whereat valor will weep. And not upon him. Masters, all be quiet. Put up your swords. My lord, when you shall know, as in this rage provoked by him you cannot, the great danger which this man's life did owe you, you'll rejoice that he is thus cut off. Please it, your honours, to call me to your senate. I'll deliver myself your loyal servant, or endure your heaviest censure. Bear from hence his body, and mourn you for him. Let him be regarded as the most noble course that ever herald did follow to be burned. His own impatience takes from Aphidius a great part of blame. Let's make the best of it. My rage is gone. And I'm, I'm struck with sorrow. Take him up, help. Three of the chiefest soldiers, I'll be one. Beat thou the drum, let it speak mournfully. Trail your steel pikes. Though in this city he hath widowed and unchilded many a one, which to this hour bewail the injury Yet he shall have a noble memory. Assist!
Congratulations, one and all. What a sensational evening that has been. Please come out here, give yourselves a big, massive, loud and rowdy round of applause. Absolutely thrilling show tonight, everyone. Thank you so very, very much. Take a bow. You've more than earned it. For those watching around the world at home, thank you so much for joining us and allow me to introduce you to tonight's cast and crew, starting as always with our incredible producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm an actor and innovation project manager based in Glasgow. And with thanks to our associate director, stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram, who sadly had to jump off the call at the interval. On music and sound, it's Adam Gibson. Hi, I'm Adam. I'm a sound designer and composer currently based in London. Fabulous. And our amazing cast for this evening. First off, as Caius Martius, Coriolanus, Alex Dunmore. Woo! Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Dunmore. I uh, am an actor and an accent coach uh, living in London. Menenius Agrippa, Jonathan Oliver. Hello, I'm Jonathan Oliver. I'm an actor and I'm based in West London. Sicinius Valutus, Drew Patterson. I'm Drew Patterson. I'm an actor and an emerging writer, I hope, and I live in central London. Cominius Wayne Lee. Hi, I'm Wayne Lee. I'm an actor and educator here in Los Angeles, California. Volumnia, Joyce Branner. Hello, I'm an actor, writer, director based in Yorkshire. Tullus Aphidius, Sean Eleanor Green. Good evening, good afternoon. I'm Sean. I'm an actor based in North London. Ah! <laughs> Julius Brutus, Andrew Mockler. Hi, I'm Andrew Mockler. I'm an actor and a musician originally from Middlesbrough. Titus Larches, Paula Brett. I'm Paula. I'm an actor, puppeteer and broadcaster from West London. As first Roman citizen, Megan Montgomery. Hi, I'm Megan. I am an actor and filmmaker and I am in North Carolina, the United States. First Roman senator, Alexis Danen. Hi, I'm Alexis Danen. I'm an actor based in London, originally from France. I'm really happy to be here. Second Roman citizen, Eleanor Wilkinson. Hi, I'm Eleanor Wilkinson. I'm an actor, singer and producer based in Suffolk in the United Kingdom. Third Roman citizen, Jamie Gould. Hi, I'm Jamie Gould. I am a theatre maker currently living in Edinburgh. Virgilia Charlotte Coles. Hi, I'm Charlotte Coles. I'm an actor, dancer, singer, and I'm based in London, but I'm originally from Yorkshire, so. First messenger, first Volskian senator, John Otto Piquet. Hi, I'm John Otto Piquet. I am an actor and writer based in Johannesburg, South Africa. As young Martius, Hector Bateman. Hi, my name is Hector Bateman, and I'm a 10-year-old professional actor in Surrey. Amazing. Thank you so much, Hector. And our ensemble for this evening, first of all, is Lewis Alcock. Hi, everyone. I'm Lewis Alcock. I'm an actor based in London, but originally from Lancashire. Nathan Everett Patterson. Hello, I'm Nathan. I'm from Dublin, Ireland, and I'm an actor and graphic designer. It's my first time doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Charrett. Hello, I'm Stephen Charrett. I'm an actor based in South London. Chi Chi Onua. Hello, hi, uh, my name is Chichi Anua. I'm an actor, mover, singer, currently located in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Nadia Nadif. Hello, I'm Nadia, I'm an actor and a singer and I live in London, I'm from Essex and it's my first time doing this as well. And our wonderful associate producer, Matthew Rhodes. Hi, I'm Matthew Rhodes. I'm an emerging theater artist on unceded Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh territory, also called Vancouver, Canada. Shamiso Moshambe. Hi, my name is Shamiswa Mushambi. I'm an actor, a comedy writer and presenter based in London. Gareth Balai. Hi, I'm Gareth Balai. I'm a professional actor, singer and dancer based in East London. And the wonderful Emily Carding. Hi, I'm Emily Carding. I'm an actor and theatre maker based in Hastings, UK. Fantastic. Congratulations to each and every one of you. Absolutely sensational evening. That honestly right up there in my favourite shows 
In the whole season, I absolutely love this play and you brought it to life absolutely sensationally. Do we have Janet on the line? It would appear not, but nevertheless, I'm going to give a shout out to the wonderful Janet, our uh, resident uh, fight choreographer, Janet Lawson. Uh, not only an amazing fight choreographer, but also a fantastic fight performer for this evening's show. Uh, also the president of the British Academy and stage and screen, screen combat and the founder of Stage Combat, oh my God, Stage Combat Scotland. Janet Lawson, thanks so much, Janet. Amazing, amazing work tonight. Really fantastic, thank you. Uh, so, uh, audience, if you have any questions for our amazing cast and crew this evening, please do get those in and we will be very happy to answer them. In the meantime, please do like this video, subscribe to the channel, of course, hitting the bell notification to receive all notifications. We have just four shows left and I wouldn't want you to miss them. Uh, and they are The Winter's Tale, Cymbeline, Henry VIII, and the Tempest. Now you might have noticed that we've kind of broken our own rule a little bit there because Henry VIII was written after The Tempest, but it's such a cracking show that we thought to hell with it all, we're gonna finish with The Tempest. So we've got four shows left to do. All of them are bangers, some of them are hidden treasures. I highly recommend that you subscribe now to make sure that you're uh, the first to know about those incredible shows coming up in the next four weeks. Uh, in the meantime, of course, if you've enjoyed what you've seen tonight, and please do remember, of course, that we now have a library of 32 shows for you to watch, all written by the incredible William Shakespeare. If you are enjoying that fact, please do consider making a donation to our Patreon page or uh, get yourself some TSMGO swag from our wonderful Redbubble store, details for all of which can be found in the video description. Thank you so much, everyone. Congratulations, cast and crew, once again, absolutely tremendous. Sarah, do we have any questions? Um, I have one here, yes, um, uh, which uh, is for the cast entirely. Uh, so the question is, what images in the language um, of the play struck you most forcibly? That's a fantastic question. And I just want to say, because of the content of this play in particular, I would like to remind everyone that we have the wonderful Hector on the call and to keep your language PG appropriate, because there are discussions to be had. Uh, which I would like you to uh, achieve using only direct quotes and you can let the audience do the maths. Uh, but yes, over to you, a wonderful cast. Favourite lines, uh, most striking images, all that kind of thing. Well, um, I'll start. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of animals. Um, curs, foxes, geese, hares. Um, and I suppose for Coriolanus, he he sees himself more of them as a machine than an animal. So it's a pejorative term, um, usually when he's saying that. So that was interesting for me. Yeah, the oh, animals for me as well, because uh, Talus is referred to as a lion, mm -hmm. Coriolanus as a dragon, and especially the lion thing, it was in my mind a lot just because of this idea that you can't have two alpha males in a pride of lions and one or the other of them has got to go. But yeah, the animal imagery is, in a very PG sense, very inspiring. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Any, anybody else got some good ones? The, the, the word pride, I think, is, is umpteen times in there, uh, both as a positive and a negative. Uh, yeah, we kept noticing that. And blood, too. It's, uh, it must be up there with Macbeth in the number of blood references and uh, obviously Alex was so far steeped in blood etc etc uh, so yes it's uh, blood is key both 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 the uh, you know the gore but also blood that makes a patrician a patrician and the lack of same makes a plebeian a plebeian so blood in all its facets Wonderful answer. Uh, 21 instances of the word blood in this play. Uh, so yes, absolutely uh, thick with it, as you might say. Any other wonderful candidates from our lovely cast? I was like thinking a, some... Yeah. Oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh. Okay, we'll I'm go. Sorry, I'm sorry, we'll I'm not allowed to speak, I forgot. Yes, no lines for carding, that's the rule. No lines for carding. <laughs> so we'll start with you, Emily, and then we'll go to Alexis and then Lewis, please. Um, I just wanted to say how some of the moments when the language becomes incredibly simple are some of the most powerful moments for me. It's always that 
oh mother what have you done that just is 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 the most incredibly powerful moment i think from that that's the line that always sticks in my mind and it's so simple and powerful fantastic example it's monosyllables whenever he's got the biggest meatiest weightiest things to say he bangs it out in monosyllables put out the light and then put out the light bosh phenomenal work shakes cheers buddy uh alexis please yeah uh, i think the my favorite uh, line is of course the most famous one the, there is a world elsewhere and i think that's when yes there is something else and and, and when she says i banish you that that's also the strongest one. I mean, I had like goosebumps every time I heard it. I also really like the images at the beginning of the play when it's ref the reference to the body parts, the belly, the, the toe, the, uh, yeah, I think it's really questioning society even today. It's like, who is the belly today? Who is the toe? There is no toe, but who is the head and who pretends to be the head? So it's really, that play was really, really um, interesting in that regard, yeah. Absolutely. There's a line in here that, that punched me in the face when we read it for the first time. Repeal daily any wholesome act established against the rich yeah. and provide more piercing statutes daily to chain up and restrain the poor. Yeah. Could have been yeah. written tomorrow, never mind yesterday. Lewis, over to you. Um, animals do come into this, but on a more broader scale, just the very varied and wide ranging words which Coriolanus uses to describe people of a lower social status than him. Like, phew, it, like his disdain is so obvious in his language and the way he describes him. It's a different word every single time. Um, and it, it needs no translation of how he feels about um, that. Absolutely, absolutely. Some of the most vivid, I'd say, uh, language comes from his, his scorn, doesn't it, for the people? Absolutely. Any more for any more? Um, I think my favourite uh, image is one that um, when Valeria goes to visit uh, Virgilia and Volumnia and she's talking about uh, their son Hector. Oh, well, played by Hector, rather. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, and she describes him chasing a butterfly and then biting its head off which by modern standards is a behaviour which would cause you concern if anybody went around chasing anything and biting its head off. That would be, that would be a cause for concern. But it just goes serves to reiterate the way in which women in this play uh, reinforce the way in which men are shaped to behave and reinforce from a very young age this kind of toxic version of masculinity in which, you know, it's, it's black or white, it's winners and losers, it's I do the devouring or I'm devoured. And I just, I just thought it was so vivid the way she um, just serves that image up. And it's like, oh yes, this is fine. This is exactly what, how men should be and how they behave. So. I got Fantastic. one. Yeah, go for it, Nathan. It's just one word, but it's when Coriolanus calls the Roman citizens fragments. It's just the deepest cut. It's like, they're nothing. They're just pieces of glass off a of broken glass, you know? It's just, they're nothing. Oh, it's so, it punches you. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh yeah, go on, What Shamisa said made me think as well about tears. Tears occur so often and it like, it's often kind of a caveat to a man in the play admits, trying to say, I'm not being manly enough here. Um, but yeah, just tears, water, or oh. Absolutely, very much a play of fire and water, this one, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. It's also interesting, following on from that, that um, the women cry, the women weep. Coriolanus doesn't understand, for example, why his wife weeps for joy. Menenius weeps out of uh, a combination of joy and grief, worry, terror, love of Rome, love of Coriolanus. But also uh, what we were saying about, you know, masculinity, and Coriolanus, of course, was made what he was, it seems to us, doesn't it, looking at the play, by his mother. So what does that say about the path that males tread? How much is forced upon them? How much is, you know, nature, nurture, all that? But it, it's a, I mean, especially in this play, which is so hard and male in so many ways. And yet at the heart of it, there is this woman, Volumnia. Fascinating. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I'd love to throw over to you to uh, speak to that uh, briefly, Joyce, if you'd uh, if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, she's. Um, I, I think she is someone that would have gone to war in, in modern times. She's she's a soldier in her heart, and so she's living vicariously through her son, uh, and so everything that's sort of fighty is 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 praised, and anything not uh, is is poo pooed. And um, yeah, that whole. The whole, yeah, crying as a weakness. Um, and it's really lovely that then right at the end, then he cries. And his, was it his eyes sweat? Is that is that the line, Alex? Sweat compassion, um, is it? Yeah. Sweat <laughs> compassion. And it's, yeah, I think they they do love each other, but it's 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 an odd, it's an odd, odd relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jamie, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking on sticking with this subject of, of crying and that um, it's interesting because it's different to a lot of other Shakespeare plays where you get these sort of powerful male leader figures who are, if they're in tears, it's a show of being genuine and therefore a show of strength. It's like, hey, look, I'm I'm crying. This means I, I mean what I'm saying. You can trust me. And in Coriolanus's case, it's just like, oh, you've made me cry. Well, my life is over now. <laughs> Peace out. Uh, <laughs> I'm gone. I, I have nothing more to... It's like I can't hide behind that shield anymore. And that, that's an interesting sort of comparison. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting actually comparing this with the earlier Roman plays and in particular Julius Caesar for, for what is so similar and what is so different. Uh, and I feel like that that's one of those uh, key kind of transformations between the two plays. Um, we had a question come in uh, someone said that they'd just be fascinated to hear from Sean and Alex uh, about what it was like to embody such masculine, hyper toxic masculine uh, kind of characters, uh, and and what that what that felt like going through it. Um, I've got my mic on, so I'll speak first. Um, it was really really fun, <laughs> um, but I'm glad that's not my life. Um, I, uh, yeah, I was teaching yesterday morning before rehearsals and my, uh, my student said, wow, you're really scary today. I'm like, yeah, I'm Coriolanus. Sorry. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really fun to um, I, I have rage, to express rage because women are not supposed to do that. And, um, and it's, um, uh, it's really fun to um, kind of practice switching off compassion and go, I don't understand. I have no empathy. Um, uh, everyone just do what I say and then everything will be fine. It's, it's really fun to kind of explore a person that thinks like that. Um, but obviously coming from the place of a person who doesn't think like that meant that I could cry <laughs> at the end um, and do that as well. Um, so, yes, that's my thoughts, my incoherent thoughts. Sean? Very coherent, in my opinion. Um, yeah, we had, we talked a bit in the, the kind of brief rehearsal period that we had about this idea of manifesting masculinity as a woman and I think it can be really easy to get carried away by this sort of projection of what well, what would a man do in this situation? But it's um, to kind of internalize it. And what I felt like, and maybe this is wrong, but what I felt like I needed to do was I was feeling it, but I just wasn't allowed to project it because that's not what they're allowed to do. So this, we talked a bit about being sort of like a wounded animal and it's, it was something that like, if I was playing a woman, I might allow my feelings to be externalized that bit more or to let other people know how I'm feeling. But playing this male macho character, it was a case of having that journey almost in my head and my heart, but not letting anyone know about it because we can't. Um, but yeah, also, I mean, what Jonathan said about Volumnia and how she affects, like to toxic masculinity is obviously something that everyone is is a victim of like the patriarchy it's not like women are the victims and men are the aggressors it's it's something that affects us all because it's just so prevalent and so damaging so I hope that you know Alex and I playing these male characters it was a learning experience for us as much as as anything else and yeah I mean I'm not speaking for you Alex sorry but um yeah 
it is just really great and interesting. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just add one more thing in that um, when we were rehearsing, Rob said a couple of times, stop smiling because um, women placate and women smile and yes. men do it much less, which made me think of Aaron Burr's advice to Hamilton, talk less, smile, smile more. more. Yes. Uh, so that's men talk more, smile less, yeah. and talk less, smile more. Yeah, especially with the sexuality, my instinct was always to sort of smile. And then yeah. it was like, Don't. smize. <laughs> Rob, Rob said smize. Smize. Um, yeah, that's such smile. a good reference. Talk yeah, less, smile more. Yeah. What was that, Jonathan? When men smile. He's gone. He's on mute. Oh, you've muted yourself. I muted That's myself. I was saying when men smile, there are daggers in their smiles. Yeah, there are daggers. There's, There's daggers in men's smiles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, when we came to this, in my head, there was a really, really tough line to tread. And the way that I looked at it was that Coriolanus is a super weapon. And uh, context defines whether that's a superhero or a supervillain. And we get to see both through the course of the play because there is no space for him in civics. <laughs> uh, and yet he absolutely excels in war. And what I think it reminds me of is how often you'll get experts or experts in one field. People will then think or just naturally assume that they're experts in every field. Um, I mean, the one that's just immediately popped into my brain, it might not be the best example, but uh, Donald Trump's doctor is an osteopath um, that's talking to the press. And, but but he's a doctor, so he must know everything. Uh, and that's not the case at all. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that what we were doing wasn't making uh, Coriolanus the villain, if you like, um, and wasn't really making anyone the villain. You know, there, there's it's one of the most politically mature, politically savvy plays that manages to present both sides of the argument and you do a disservice to the audience if you come down 100% on one side and just make it a tub thumping kind of um uh I don't know display piece I suppose um and I think that the points that that uh, our wonderful uh women cast members have already made uh is that toxic masculinity affects everyone and, and men are victims of it too and I thought Sean that the way that you put that was just a beautiful summation of of um of, of how it feels to be a guy in 2020 as well um I think there's really there's really difficult things that that this play forces us to look at and explore and it's it's really exciting to be able to do that with a piece that stunningly feels as fresh as this one does uh, really extraordinary Alexis. Yeah, no, just uh, I had one, one line that I thought was a bit tricky to address. Because, um, I think it's in 5.3 five, five, when he says, Coriolanus says, ladies, you deserve to have a temple built. You, all the souls in Italy and her constituent arms could not have made this piece. And um, when I read that the first for the first time, I was like, so basically Shakespeare has written this line in as an homage, homage, homage to... Uh, women but uh but um the, the way it was performed tonight i thought that it was like women are were entitled to go to war like even like the amazons or like there there are examples of women who used to fight so i don't i don't know i didn't know what to do with this line if, if it's what do you I, I would yeah i wanted to know what the alex and i mean the member of the cast thought about that because it's a bit is it an homage or is it just something reducing women to people who just not fight and just make peace, you know? <laughs> See what I mean? Well, um, it's sort of relevant to that, I think. Um, when I hear what Volumnia has done, what Volumnia and the family have done to save Rome, uh, Menenius very clearly and genuinely celebrates her as a woman. Uh, or does he celebrate her as a woman or does he celebrate her as someone who saved the city who happens to, to be a woman. That's, that's possibly an interesting point. But uh, she is a treasure to him because of what she's done in saving Rome. Yeah, okay. Alex, what did it mean to you? Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I was reading a text message when you were talking. Alexis, please, would you repeat what you... What you yeah, know? okay, quickly, it was just, uh, what, what do you think about the line when you say, um, I mean, when Coralina says that uh, 
the ladies deserve deserve to have a temple built because they made a piece and all the souls in Italy couldn't have done that. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I'd like to yeah. know. Um, well, I mean, the, I, it might be Shakespeare just being literal because they did have a temple built to them uh, for making the piece. Um, uh, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know, because he's so conflicted at that point, Coriolanus. What did Shakespeare mean? Uh, I mean, I guess my view of Volumnia is that she's uh, she may be a bit of a monster, but she's uh, she can at least play the game, and therefore maybe that makes her more dangerous, but it makes it also makes her more human. And Coriolanus can't cope with um, having to play the game and can't cope when he breaks down. So, um, so I, I guess. Volumnia is therefore a more rounded character, more rounded human being. Yeah. And that's what is meant by that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Shimiso, quickly, go for it, finish us off. Um, this is probably totally irrelevant, but when I heard that line, I thought there might be a tiny, tiny, tiny part of Coriolanus which envied the position that his mother was in because she's able to do a thing that he can't, uh, which is... Um, emote and through emoting engineer a uh, piece there might be a part a tiny part of Coriolanus that wishes to do that that somehow wishes to but it's only through her coming to him and presenting herself this way and emoting so heavily and speaking to that part of him he'd be able to access that part and therefore tread the tread the path towards peace even though he knows that he will eventually die because of it I just yeah I just that that's what I heard but that was just like an aside Love it, love it. Uh, I'd love to go over to uh, Nathan now, uh, just returning momentarily to the subject of uh, toxic masculinity. You had some interesting thoughts here in the chat. Yes, I did, and I should have just <laughs> volunteered them aloud. But no, it's based on what Sean was saying a couple of points ago um, about going through Tolus Ophidius's journey completely internally, and you're feeling all of this, but the character itself wouldn't wouldn't externalize it, wouldn't show it. And that is something that as a trans guy, it's so true. Like, of course, I can't speak to everyone's experience, but growing up where I did, living in the city I do, which is Dublin, Ireland, um, having the friends I had and the family I had and just the acquaintances I had, what I've noticed so much is after coming out, it slowly became less and less emoting became less and less a part of who I am as a person um like and it happens both consciously and unconsciously it's as soon as you're trying to especially before you do anything medical if that's your choice to do a medical transition like I did um people before that happens you feel this oh this need to like prove in every other way um that you're a, a real man you know and so over time becoming less comfortable talking to friends about the deep stuff um you know uh just showing outward emotion less smiling less that was one of the things smiling less um you know turning to friends for mental health support not at all anymore and over time it's become we have this kind of large circle but by the time by now like six plus years later the only person i feel comfortable talking to about mental health is an actual like counselor or therapist like not even family you know it's like there is a person and this is their job and no one else gets to hear you know the innermost thoughts of this man whereas like before i i just felt more comfortable of course you know there was lots of things i didn't feel comfortable doing but it's kind of it's a weird trade-off and balance it's like you get to feel you get to finally be yourself, but at the expense of now you have to live up to all these expectations that are forced upon you, whether you even realize you're doing it or not. And it's, I'm kind of just saying this to kind of prove Sean's point about a super hyper masculine character's arc. It's like you're doing all this amazing character work um, and you almost feel like, well, what are people going to see? Because um, it's all internal. It's all in there and it only comes out at little flashes of different moments in the show um, but otherwise it's entirely contained and just hearing you say that it's like yep yeah, 
this is true. It, it happened to me um, and you summed it up really succinctly better than I did, but I thought I should just be like, it's true. Thank you so much for chipping in with that, Nathan. Really appreciate it. Jamie, I believe you've got some thoughts as well. Yeah, I've been um, really lucky that I had a number, particularly a, a, one particular close uh, female friend um, who's been with me through my entire transition. I'm about six years in, same as you. Um, and so that's been really helpful. I was also, I've, I've always been one of these people who's always been very open about talking about stuff, but not necessarily particularly demonstrative necessarily. Um, and starting the, the different hormones, man, that, that makes that go so much more into stark relief. Um, I was never much of a person to, you know, I mean, crying. We've talked about crying in this. Uh, I physically can't anymore. I cannot remember the last time I properly. Same. Yeah, Same. it's it's a thing that's it's it's a very common thing. Um, I never did it that much anyway. Um, I actually was mentioning in the chat, actually, Sharon, you, your performance reminds me so much. I had a best friend at school who was very much a tomboy, had younger and older brothers. Your cadence and energy is so spot on to hers that it was just it, that kind of was striking me all the way through the show. Um, but she's actually the one who kind of, you know, built me up and stopped me being a wuss when I was like 12. Uh, it was like, you know, taught me how not to cry falling over in the road if I scraped my knee up or something. Um, and, you know, it was another 20 years before I actually came out and transitioned, but it was still, I don't know if that was part of it. And that I've had this sort of weird off the binary masculinization that had started much earlier. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, I've been, I've also been lucky to be very much surrounded by uh, a lot of my male friends are kind of in this uh, male mental health because uh, I spend a lot of time online and that's something that goes around. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to, to be a part of that. Um, and it's, it has saved a couple of lives in my friend group in the last decade or so and failed to in one or two cases as well. So um, it's, it's something that's at the forefront of a lot of my friends, which is really a good thing because, yeah, as you say, it's so easy to slide back to just going, oh, yeah, we'll interact if we're just the lads, you, you, you know, making fun of each other and, you know, trying to break each other down a lot of the time. Um, and that's that's been a tough language to learn. <laughs> Yeah, it's so fascinating, isn't it? That it, I, th I think obviously this this lens on this particular topic is is just so extraordinary. And thank you both so much for sharing. Um, I think it, it really sheds a light, puts in stark relief. I think you said, Jamie. Uh, I think is a really w good way of putting it. Um, just how much of this is socialised, just how much of this is conditioning, and and that it can. <sighs> It can happen, I guess, at different times of life as well. Um, but I do think that there's hope there that if if it can be learned, it can be unlearned, uh, or or we can learn a different, we can learn a new masculinity, we can learn a non toxic masculinity. And I think that's something that reading this play and exploring this play with you all over the past few days has just been a really interesting thing to just see flagging up and you know part of that is seeing amazing actors like uh sean and alex going woman you know ju just that tone you know just these tiny little things uh that feel like they're stitched into the text it's uh it's it it really does heighten it i think in that way uh makes it makes it makes it easier to see it, it makes it a lot more clear i think yeah Wonderful. Sarah, do we have one more question to finish off? Oh, let me see. So uh, I'll, I'll, ooh, I'm, I'm trying to pick with, between the couple I've got. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to read them out and I'll pick? Yeah, go on then. All right. <laughs> well, because one's like a technical kind of texty question and the other one's more of a character one. Okay. There you go. So one of them is, uh, what are your thoughts on there not being revealing soliloquies in the play? Uh, that's a texty one. And the other one is, how many people liked their character? Fabulous. I reckon we'll go into the soliloquy of the two. I mean, if all right, let's very quickly do it. Did you like your character? Hands up. I kind of expect nine out of ten hands to go up because 
an actor's number one job is to like <laughs> relate to who they're playing, right? And fight their corner. So yeah, I'll, I'll be surprised otherwise. Um, lack of soliloquies. I mean, what what have Nathan and Jamie just been talking about? Well, like, yeah. Um, uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, Coriolanus doesn't want to look inside himself. That's, that's pointless and time wasting. And, and if he did, he might actually have some feelings. So I think that's genius of Shakespeare to give him very little soliloquy time. What is there, one or maybe two? Yeah, I mean, we, like, we, we kind of went with the sides, didn't we? Like yeah. we, we found a couple of the sides in there just. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it's no Macbeth, it's no Hamlet, despite being an enormous part. Uh, nope, he, he doesn't really want to be, uh, doesn't really want to talk to himself. <laughs> mm. Look inside himself. Certainly doesn't want anyone else in there rummaging no around way. either. No way. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating. Just a quick thought on that. I just think it's so interesting um, because if you were to translate that to today, I feel like there are um, people who would like to look within themselves, but maybe don't have the skill set to even know what that might look like. So. Yeah, they might find themselves shutting off because that's easier than trying to work because uh, it is work, and I think that's I think that's the part that people forget. Yeah, absolutely. Fabulous point. Fabulous point. It's a le it's a learned skill. It's something that needs practice. You know, like muscles, we build them up. God, what a, what a toxically masculine metaphor. <laughs> but uh, yeah, go. Well, it was interesting what Megan was saying there, because until I found acting and the sort of acting community, I grew up in a sort of that style of toxic masculinity, lots of sports and these sorts of things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But being able to step into another because everyone, as far as my experience and usually is, is uh, very open in the industry that we're in. We're all very different and very embracing of things. And it's I think that's one of the problems that he, uh, Cor Coriolanus has is that because of the, it's the environment he's in if he was allowed to step out of it maybe he might be able to um show a different side to him in which a soliloquy could be of of of, of benefit to him but because of what he the environment he's in he's basically constrained yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah uh, I think Joyce uh, I think you had your hand up if you want to uh, uh well, yeah, well, I was just saying that the the reason for the lack of soliloquies and the fact that uh, uh, Coriolanus doesn't have the emotional intelligence is that he was brought up by this woman who also, you know, uh, she doesn't cry at the gate. She gets angry. She gets, she just, and, you know, when, when Menenius tries to comfort her, she says, anger is my meat. You know, that's, she, she, hopefully right at the end, she gets upset, but they both have to be brought to that pitch, you know, uh, where, where everything is at stake, where their lives and their country is at stake before they actually show any, any emotion apart from anger. Yeah, yeah, so interesting, isn't it? What What is a permissible emotion? Because the extreme is as extreme, just in a different direction. Paula? The speeches that Coriolanus does, the big in front of the crowd, are so, so passionate. An emotional in a very performative way that is acceptable and it's interesting looking at those you know go and show them your scars and the persona of being a war hero and the persona of being this person who can lead and the persona of being all that Lartius harks on about you are this you are that and it's like if you try and say, oh, no, no, I don't want to, actually, I'm not feeling great about that, other people go, oh, no, but, you, but you're wonderful. And you, I think when you're pedestaled like that, you get trapped in this, like, oh, I can't because no one will hear it. <laughs> you can't just not talk about it. No one will hear it. And I do think that is particularly a problem uh, for people who find themselves uh, at, a, at the top of a pile to an extent. It's like the, the cost of, of being vulnerable becomes too great after a time and you just can't. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, Sean? Um, slightly less deep, I guess, but another thing with the soliloquies, 
something that strikes me about this play so much is how much everything is about antithesis and balance and you know the rich versus the poor the government versus the the people Tullus versus uh, like it just everything's like mother versus son so the the space for self exploration isn't really there no one's very existential because they're only looking at themselves in comparison to the other thing and so we don't get those sort of stepping back and exploring the self soliloquy because there's just no room for it maybe yeah the enemy's always outside jonathan uh, yes, um, just that looking at it from a slightly different point of view, from the point of view of the writing of a play and the crafting of the play, the soliloquy was, was of course often not a deep internal monologue, but a character speaking directly to the audience. And, and this can happen with Hamlet, it can happen with Richard III, you don't have to be a, you know, you can be a villain. Iago has speeches to the audience. What it needs, even with Iago, I think, is some sort of empathy that the audience want to hear your thoughts. They want to listen to you direct. Never mind what's happening in the narrative. So, what have you got to say for yourself? But of course, Coriolanus is utterly without empathy. So, there is no reason why he should want to speak to an audience or why an audience should want to hear, in that sense, direct from him. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always think, I mean, it feels like a globe play this for me rather than a, an indoor show. Um, and I think a large part of that is that that crowd, those plebeians, I think are there to stir up the groundlings that would have actually been there in reality. And those are the people that are closest to the stage, the ones that you would be communicating with primarily if you were doing soliloquies. And he, and, and he shows such an exhaustive ex extent is contempt for those kind of people. <laughs> yeah, the, la the last thing you'd want to do is explain his rationale about something or, or come to them with a problem. Yeah, yeah, fabulous. Any other thoughts before we finish off everyone? Just thanks for letting us do this and being a great director. We almost made it, Sean. <laughs> thanks. I don't so actually much. know how you do it. This is what, number 30, 32, and you've this done every 32. single one. It is astonishing. Congratulations. Do you think, like, after actually sitting back as a swing and not having all the actor, like, oh, but what about this jacket? And what about this facial hair? Well, you Without all of those little thoughts and just sitting and watching the big picture from like day one, I was like, okay, wow. Like I had respect for Rob before, but and, and to have been doing this nonstop since March. I was like, wow. So yeah, pretty amazing. And I have to say as well- And it's Sarah, just, but yeah, it's just because right. I was watching Rob, Sarah's very invisible in her work, but yeah, impressed. I also wanted to say it's very rare that you get the opportunity to really feel Shakespeare be reinvented and revitalized in a new format. And the way that you guys have taken Zoom and this situation that we all find ourselves in really turned it into this wonderfully positive thing every week is just astonishing and truly hats off to you and the entire team. Thanks so much. And I'm going to end it there. <laughs> <laughs> no, just oh, sorry, but it's just the thought came, but and then we're done. But it's just the the idea of bravery. Um, I mean, when we think about Roman times, bravery was going to war, to fight, to be a man. All we've discussed. But I think I don't know. I just the whole show me is going online. It's not like um, I mean, the idea of bravery is to questioning all our ideas, prejudices, and everything. And I think on every single show. And uh, that, that's what impressed me the most. Like, I remember, like, could it be um, the Merchant of Venice about different questions? But there was always this process of questioning our thoughts, our prejudices about gender, about racism and all these things. And I think that's the true bravery of nowadays, you know? And I think that's what this kind of project is bringing. It's not going to war or fighting a fucking virus. Sorry for that, but <laughs> it's just questioning ourselves. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, we, we can only do what we are fitted to bear. Is that the Marcus Aurelius quote? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's th this this is this is what we can do. We can focus on what we can do or what we can't do. And I can't do much about a, a, 
a global virus, sadly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, it was, was a bad example. <laughs> and, you know, no, absolutely, no, no. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not wishing. <laughs> I'm not taking it as a jab. Don't worry. I'm simply, simply saying that if we fa- <laughs> Stephen, no. Stephen in the chats just said, "Fix it, Rob." Come on. Um, sad, sadly, not 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 on the agenda for show must go online. But uh, if we can examine ourselves and and use this time, you know, so, someone said with, with the theatre shutting down, it should be a time for theatre as a whole to take some time to reflect on what it is and what it wants to be. And that's something that I hope that we're in the process of exploring and and helping other people explore just by being here, I suppose, Uh, but also just helping ourselves explore the plays and explore our approach to them and our response to them, but also ourselves as people. And I know that that's certainly, certainly happened to me. Um, Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Really appreciate it. We're back next week with The Winter's Tale. It's a, it's a bizarre play, The Winter's Tale, but it's a magnificent play. Um, it's weird. Shakespeare seems to be doing this more and more like Time in the Athens. It's a play of two halves and they're very, very, very different. Um, but you get a, a, one of the most intense and sophisticated psychological thrillers in the second half and the most joyous, ridiculous knockabout comedy in the second half. Uh, And I can't wait to just smash those two things against each other uh, with this phenomenal speech from Time in the middle. Um, Time itself takes the stage. So uh, if you're excited to see that, tune in next week. Thanks so much, everyone, and good night.